might be good since he did all the preparation yep. for this. Um, Um, we'll call this meeting a CPDC to order. Um, so from our agenda, um, we have, uh, I'll just start off in case people are here for these particular items or we'll, we'll do, we'll, um, provide this notice later as well. Uh, there were uh, a number of items that have been um, requested to be continued for another meeting. Um, so there's no need to hang, hang out if that's what you're here for. Um, one of them uh, is 135, 139, and 149 Howard Street project. Um, another is uh, 258, 262 Main Street. Um, and the third, um, I, I was just notified that um, uh, the project at 107 Main Street has been um, requested to be continued to a um, another meeting. Um, so, so um, I would say 107 Main at 7:30. On July 8th. So they were hoping we could read and open the public hearing okay. and then continue, if that's okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, so we'll need to wait to do that until 7:45. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, if people are here for that, all we'll do for um, uh, for. Uh, 107 Main Street is open the public hearing and then continue it to um, another time, yeah. the next meeting, yeah. which will um, July 8th. July 8th. So what time? We're uh, going to choose the time at 7:45. You're going to make us wait at 15 minutes to tell us that. It's four, one of those procedural yeah. things. Is it four? Oh, I, four minutes yeah. I have. Four minutes. <laughs> you also have to wait. Thank you. That's awesome. yeah, I do have to wait. Mm -hmm. You understand why, though? Just, I do, yeah. yeah, because the public, the legal notice was for that time. For that time, yeah. Um, so you can do the same uh, But we are going to take something which was on the agenda at 7.30, the sign application at uh, 35 Lincoln Street, um, otherwise known as the Met at the Metropolitan at Reading Station. And Sarah applicant here there is oh great Uh, so this is for the 40B project, Reading Village. They are now proposing their wall signage, and I'll let Reed take it from there. Um, so on that, a signage was not addressed in the application, uh, the 40B application. Okay. Uh, my name is Reed Hayes. I represent Architect Sunworks, and I'm here on behalf of Reading MPN to uh, 
And lighting associated with those? Uh, no uh, lighting on the canopies, uh, gooseneck fixtures, three gooseneck fixtures above the wall sign. Okay. Um, and the color, I, n I noticed here it's brown. It's or, a, is it that the. Yeah, it's uh, the color that is shown on the drawings is actually a CMS color from uh, Red MKM logo. Um, there may be a slight shift in that. It will still be brown, basically. Um, we're not sure yet if we're going to try to match the, uh, the, the dark bronze color of the, of the canopies uh, as far as the brown goes. Uh, the lettering on the front of the canopy is actually shown on the drawings to match the building trim right now so that we have proper contrast and you can see that the upper part of the drawing there so you have the mat which is above the canopy fascia uh, those are individual letters uh, that are um, standing on top of the fascia and then there are individual cut letters on the fascia itself and those will uh, those will be painted to match the building trim so we have nice contrast between the dark brown and the leather. Questions from the board? No. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> um, do you realize that the zone regulations only allow you to put a sign up to the lower sill of the second floor windows? Yes, uh, we are aware of that. Um, we would like the commission to consider our wall sign for appropriateness tonight just to see if. Uh, if if, if it's going to fly, quite frankly, and if uh, if you approve it, then we will seek the appropriate All right, because I don't know if we can approve a sign that doesn't meet zoning. Uh, okay. My So I, I, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, in order to get a sign like that, you actually just have to go to okay. ZBA. Okay. Um, um, Would that appear before this commission again at a future date? Um, probably not. Probably. Once they approve it? Yeah. I'm trying to think, what was the last one? Uh, Reading co op. What you could do is you could approve the other signs and then let them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they'd be done. After they come to you and they go to zoning, or they can be done. I think the the did wrote Reading Co-op go through that process, or um, it was? Um, I think they put them lower. Sorry. Yeah. They want they were renting out their original building on Haven to a realtor, and the realtor had a sign that was up higher above the second floor windows. Told them that they couldn't do that. Obviously, well, actually, Tony told them that they couldn't do that. <laughs> um, but now I can't. I don't think so. I don't think they went ahead with that the, particular. The only one I recall that went through the ZBA was didn't um, uh, Burger King or uh, no Jiffy Lube. Jiffy Lube went through ZBA, and then I don't think it ever came back to us. Hmm. But Jiffy Lube would have been, I want to say, business A, not business B. Yeah, right. I, I'm right. just saying yeah. any yeah. sign, right. any sign that's gone through ZBA. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. on your it's business B, so you have the approval that you can have a sign, okay. and then the sign actually has to be approved. I would assume it's still a two-step oh, process. Yeah. I still think they need a certificate of appropriate in business B. So they yeah. would need the first. But they're not in business B, are they? No, no they're, they're in not. residential. Right. But right. the code <coughs> says that if if you're putting a sign up in a zone, in that zone that doesn't have any language for it, that you have to follow business B. Right. And it was issued in the decision as well that they would have to be treated as business B. In the 40B decision. So we could do what Julie said. We could approve the two lower cells. 
Right. Well, actually, you can't put the two lower signs because they're only allowed a wall sign and one canopy sign. Total. Total. A wall sign. Yeah. And a canopy sign, which is what I assume these would be. Do they? Can they? Yes, they can. What about having them do a master signage plan? Would that help them get around some of these challenges? A single tenant, <coughs> I think. I don't believe awnings and canopies have a set restricted amount. There is in table 86 for business B. Uh, is it 86? That you're allowed one wall mounted mm -hmm. and and an additional wall mounted or awning or projecting sign. And the wall mounted would have to be on a separate facade, on not on the same street. Okay. Do you want to continue on the seven and then come back to this conversation? Do that. It's time. Sure. Um. Yes. <laughs> Not super writing MDM. So the, the real purpose of how we designed this was to design it as tastefully as possible. If you took the zoning, it allows us two square feet of sign for every linear foot of frontage we have, which is a huge number. I mean, so we're not even anywhere near, like from a holistic approach, the number of square foot we could have on the side. So we'll go whichever route we need to go. I'm not worried. It might, I also would like to hear if there was an opinion on the sign. I mean, you know, I know from a zoning standpoint, but ultimately I think we come back here anyway. So if we had to go to zoning knowing that the board had, mm -hmm. you know, didn't vote on it but had a favorable, you know, I, I, you know, I would hate to go to zoning and come back and then say we went through that process but we don't like the sign. So. Uh, sure, I'll give you my opinion, is that I guess I don't think that the sign, well, uh, let me step back. I'm not so sure that um, this board has ever approved um, a sign that is more like a um, billboard um, that takes up that much, that, that's that high and takes up that much um, uh, face of a, of a building. Um, I guess from my viewpoint, the purpose of a sign is so that someone can identify, um, especially a residential building, someone to, can identify the building that they're going in. Um, I, I, I don't think that you need to have a sign that big um, to identify which address you're going to. Um, and that the name of the, the building is the Met. Um, uh, it, it, you probably won't even, when you step back some, I'm not even sure where you would get that viewpoint from. So taking it in, in context, uh, um, you, you, maybe you could see that sign as you're coming down Haven Street. I don't know exactly where it, know, like where it sits. Yeah. Um, like Ash Street, right? But you, you, well, you can see it from you'll see it from a lot of places. Yeah. I, we, I mean, I, I'm so maybe that's exactly the point. I don't want to see it from everywhere, right? I be, all I need to do is see it when I'm I, I'm on Lincoln Street. Is it that building or that building? And guess what? I probably already know. Right. Right. But from a, so. From, yeah. Uh, from, yeah. Marketing that building. Yeah. And as a, a building also that you know has a formal housing, we need to make sure from a business standpoint. Right. Right. And we recognize when people come in. For, from potentially be renters that don't know the area maybe as well as somebody who yeah but most of, most of the other rental places have a pedestal sign you know they have a sign that's, that's on the ground really I don't know of any apartment buildings right now that have a permanent sign that high that they sometimes will drape a now open kind of you know right. now renting right. kind of sign which is tacky but the alternative though is what is all, I'd what's like only to make a comment at some point is that all right this is Gerard speaking. Is that appropriate? Uh, oh, it, I, when when we open it up for a little bit more public comment. 
that, that the thought was it wouldn't take the square footage that we could have assigned and design something that you know, yeah, the, really makes, most people don't. Yeah. So yeah. and we're not you know and also Lincoln Street's more um, of the downtown area than say Prescott Street is. So that's why we didn't put any signage on Prescott except mm -hmm. for the building entrance sign. Mm -hmm. But that's also a um, it's because all the stairways are in, in that facade here. It's a big brick facade. So the sign also add some architectural value and just view from just having a big brick facade but uh, yeah. we'll go through whatever, yeah. you know, that was my, since we're not going to necessarily um, uh, come to a, a decision that's my opinion I don't know if others on the board have yeah I mean different it's opinions. six foot these are five foot letters five foot tall letters it is kind of big I have a problem with the canopy signs. They're five foot tall letters, 20 feet off the ground, uh, invisible if you're on the train, uh, because they're blocked by the train station. The train. Train station. Yeah. So it's, understand the desire, uh, but, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Others comments. Uh, one other comment. You were looking to put additional lighting on the building for your sign, but the approval process from um, the ZBA for the 40B said that only additional lighting would be used for egress and um, egress and safety. Yeah, I believe we actually are not 100, but I believe um, there's a plan that has lighting on the other side. There is a photometric plan, but it didn't list any lighting for the signage. Anyone have uh, um, other comment? I did have a comment. Is this the appropriate time to speak? Yes. I wanted to say that a, a large sign might cause more accidents, might be more distracting to commuters or travelers on the bus or the trains, might be distracting, cause accidents. I feel that's a no-go. I also think smaller is just more tasteful. I think big feels very commercial. A big sign feels very commercial. A smaller sign feels more residential and more tasteful for an apartment building than their recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, could you uh, state your name and your address for the record, please? My name is Gerard Sedigny, S-E-V-I-G-N-Y. My address is 503 West Street. And I'm just interested in the safety of people I've studied and trained in public safety. And so I just thought I would share my experience with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there a comment on this? Um, all right, so I, I understand that uh, we're not going to take action on this. Um, um, right, we'll do we need to? It's a sign application. Do we need to continue it or we just don't take action? No. And then, if you want to go to ZBA, <clears throat> um, I guess, uh, one of the canopy signs would be allowed. Yeah, in zone. I, I, I'm gonna, I, I guess, my recommendation we can move, we can take action on one of the canopy signs if you want, but I, I guess that might. Can, and that might end up <laughs> causing more confusion and, and yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, I think that's what he's saying. All right, thank you. All right, never thanks. Would, it, might, um, it would be helpful to us if you could clarify why you think only one awning is Yeah, could you read that language again? All right, we find it. That's true. Okay. 
<coughs> well, what, what zoning are we? Business B. It would be business B. Business B. Okay. So I'm looking at section 8.5.3. Right. Yeah. So allowed signs are wall mounted, projecting, which are perpendicular to the building, awning, mm -hmm. externally illuminated, and halo lit, and A frame sandwich boards. Mm -hmm. Then special regulations. A lot of building which contains more than one business bid granted the certificate of purpose for more than one sign and match of the following, but this only contains one business. Right. So then we go down to the table, because that's where it is explicitly um, put out. So table 8.6. And then you have to go down to the G. Awnings and canopies, uh, other awnings and canopies are allowed. Mm -hmm. No restrictions in number. No restrictions in number. Except for, is there a is note there? Note G. G. Is that it? I was looking at this. I think so. Quick check. No wall mounted sign for non residential establishment shall exceed sign area. No, this is a residential establishment. Right. I may be confusing it with that section A, which said that you're allowed one sign. Um, I think what matters with awnings is the size of the letters. Right, and if it counts towards sign area or not, but there's no restrictions on numbers, I believe. Just the total area, so. <clears throat> well, it says, I mean, if, if it were other awnings and canopies, uh, it says the sign permit is required, letters greater than four inches in height will count towards sign area. Right, and so I've right. made the applicant aware of that. Okay. Uh, the map letters would technically count this to sign area, but as they mentioned, due to the linear footage of the building, they can have so much area. To, Anyway, right. close yeah. to their maximum <laughs> stuff. Not a constraint. Yeah. Yeah. And the Wait, what are you what are you counting as building. area? Yes. No, what are you counting as frontage or linear frontage of what? I just took it as the length of the building is what I thought. It's a garage. The regulation. So Prescott Street's a garage. Right. But so they have a certainly doesn't count. Right. The other part might. So whatever number they come up with. 160 feet is is on Lincoln Street. Right. So okay. That's fine. I'm just saying it's not all 320. Mm -hmm. It's plenty. Yeah. Right. And their application right now stands at like 290 or something. Yeah. yeah. 280. So, yeah. All right, and it looks like I am mistaken. They can have multiple on the sides. Yeah. Yeah. If it were a second floor, they could only have two. Those, then are these going to might as well yeah. issue a C of A for those. Yeah. Unless you want to wait and see if they redesign the whole thing. Or. I'm sorry about the confusion. So, yeah. so um, I, I guess the concern over having um, the multiple um, uh, this well are those are you? I'm sorry. Are we calling those entire things canopy signs? What are you calling the top part? I called it under other awnings and canopies. Yes. Is that defined? So you're defining one of those as a candy sign and one as a wall sign? No, they're both. This is the wall sign and these two are the awnings and canopy, awning slash canopy. That's how I interpreted it. On the canopies, the Metropolitan at Reading Station part is four inches, so that doesn't count. Right. Right? Right. That's be like the band on a regular oh. one. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. We did, we did actually do that in the square footage calculations on the application. So, it's just so the canopy mess. would be the met, right? Just the met. We, we viewed the, the the entire sign itself as one mm -hmm. sign as opposed to two separate parts. Mm -hmm. So we took the total square footage of the entire sign, both parts combined. 
Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I think it's, if that's being defined as a canopy side, then it doesn't matter one way or the other of, because there's square footage. <coughs> oh, yeah, it's the square footage part, but this part is right. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's the same thing. That's the right. sign, and that's a sign. Yeah. That's the awning. Yeah. That's and, the yeah, awning. And that's the canopy. And that's the canopy sign. So, um, so we could approve just the canopy signs yeah. i mean having those having two of those one on each side that fits within the um within the zoning um and if we we could move on that um right that that, that may be of helpful may be helpful to you if that's what you you want us to to um um have an opinion on and then it, but just not a, not um have an opinion on the the larger yeah, wall sign for the larger one if we had dropped that all the way down to ground level the top would actually go be below the second floor seal which would meet the words of code but clearly yeah. not the spirit of intent of the code so that's kind of what you know we will go we'll look yeah. at the size on it but you know right. i think that's what we'll okay. probably end up with uh, so all that being said, um, what what I'd like to um, uh, focus on is the, there's some application um, with with just the um, just the two awning signs, not including the gooseneck lighting or the um, um, or the wall sign. Um, so with that, any <coughs> comments? Any further questions? Okay, so from the application, that would be sign number two and sign number three. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. So sign number one is out of the equation. So, if no other questions, do we have a motion? Uh, let's take a quick run through this. <coughs> move that the CPDC um, modify the certificate of appropriateness for the sign permit uh, for 35 Lincoln Street to strike the wall sign and approve the sign two and sign three uh, awning slash canopy signs. Do I have a second? Second. Any further comment? Just uh, delete any mention of Goose next time. Uh, only in the materials submitted, I believe. Okay. Then I just said the one sign would be externally illuminated. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All those in favor? Opposed? Opposed? Don't get the vote. Oh, no. okay. okay. <laughs> the wrong <laughs> associate <laughs> member. <laughs> All of us are here. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so back to the item um, at 107 uh, Main Street. Um, is there anything that I should read, or there's just I just got an email. Okay. Um, right. Continuing to July. All right. Um, so that item will be continued to July uh, July 8th, and. Um, do we have a time? Do we have a time that seven, can work? I think 7.30. We can do All right. Begin. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to open that up. Yeah, open the hearing. Oh, yes, if you can. Do we I believe I provided the legal yeah. notice yeah. in your packet. Yeah. Sorry, Terry. Monarch. 
<laughs> Sorry, I gave you a few legal notices. One oh seven Main Street. This is right. Oh, this must be it. Selling, selling, selling. Yeah. Hold them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Notice is hereby given that pursuant to sections 4.3 and 4.6 of the Town of Reading Zoning Bylaw, the Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing in the Selects Board Meeting Room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading Mass, on Monday, June 10, 2019, at 7.30 p.m. On the petition of Michael Palmer for a major modification to a site plan review for additional parking in the southeast area of the lot located at 107 Main Street, which is Assessor's Map 8, Lot 1 in Reading, Mass. A copy of the application associated plans are available to the public and the Public Services Department in Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m and on town website the Thursday prior to the hearing date. All right, thank you. Um, and so I, I think we started having a motion about continuing it. Uh, at the request of the applicant, the move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for um, major modifications for, to the site plan review at 107 Main Street until Monday, July 8th, 2019 at 7.30 p.m. Second. Oh, Point of order, Mr. Chairman? Certainly. Mm -hmm. I thought the plan here was to open up for public comment and then to continue. Um, uh, mm, open no, the hearing. Open the hearing. Yeah. And, and yeah, continue. yeah okay. we don't have anything to, to comment oh. on. Okay. So, thank you, though. Um, all those in favor? Sorry. Right. Yes. <laughs> so. Twenty-five minutes of my time. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get it back. <laughs> the wheels of government are slow. No one said any up, anything otherwise. So uh, that um, notice won't be posted again. No. Nope. Um, so you know when the date is. Nothing else will go out associated with that, but it'll be on on the eighth. And they're actually yeah, they're yeah. 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 yeah, so there's a white line Alright. Next item on the agenda is um, uh, Austin Prep School field work. Um, yeah. on it. Yeah. Sure. Notice of public hearing. Notice is hereby given that pursuant to sections 4.3 and 4.6 of the Town of Reading Zoning Bylaw, Community Planning and Development Commission will hold a public hearing in the Select Board's meeting room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading Mass, on Monday, June 10, 2019, at 7.30 p.m. on the petition of Austin Preparatory School for a site plan review for the improvements and upgrades to the lower field located at 101 Willow Street, Assessor's Map 26, Lot 74, in Reading Mass. A copy of the application and associated plans are available to the public in the Public Services Department at the Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on the town website the Thursday prior to the hearing date. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, Andrew, do you, or Julie, do you have anything to start, or shall we just... Uh, so this is just a separate site plan application from what they were here for almost exactly a year ago, I believe. Uh, so this regards to their lower fields, as they call them, improving some of the work there. So I'll let them explain a bit further, though. Okay. So, all right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Chris Latham for Austin Preparatory School. Uh, for the board's reference, a nonprofit religious and educational establishment located on along Willow Street. Uh, also present today is head headmaster Dr. James Hickey, CFO John Weber, uh, athletic director uh, Jonathan Pollard, and project landscape architect uh, Chris Huntress. For reference, um, the 40-acre campus is located in the S20 zoning district, with portions of the campus in the African Protection District, and portions of the property also in the flight plan. Uh, it's anticipated this project will see CPDC state plan review approval, conservation approval, with the fully orders of conditions and health department approval staff. The school is in the process of raising funds uh, through donations to improve the existing physical education and support facilities, namely the, what we call the lower fields, which are along the railroad tracks. Uh, this is the uh, project that's before the board tonight. Uh, for the board's reference, um, if funds become available in the future, there is a hope um, that there will be additional physical education uh, improvements that will be done to other parts of the campus as well, but that's not what we're here about tonight. So what we're here about tonight is what we have actual, uh, hopefully, money left. Okay. So the project uh, before the CBD is to improve the existing baseball field and what we refer to as the all-purpose sports field. Uh, and as well as to construct tennis courts uh, in what we call the lower field, which is along the train tracks. And the proposed improvements to the lower foot field include a subsurface recharge system, which is going to be covered with synthetic turf. That's because that's located in the protection district. Uh, also, it's going to be a pertinence to the baseball field, which would include uh, bleachers and dugouts, uh, bullpen, press box, a restroom. Um, there's obviously going to be a scoreboard, uh, which is an example in the plans. And there's going to be some lighting. There's also going to be uh, a turf infield uh, just for practice. And um, we're also proposing construction of six uh, tennis courts with uh, a storage, storage facility and lighting. Um, the school is acting as a good neighbor and it's actually had meetings with some of the abutters. Um, we're also in discussions with the town to address some of the town's concerns relative to drainage and conservation. Um, and likewise, the school is willing and has been in the past and, and is in the future to um, work with some of the town sports organizations relative to some of the use of athletic facilities. So honestly, we believe this project is a win-win for both the town and the school because this project is consistent with the town's objectives, which are stated in the Town Building Space and Recreation Plan of 2012 and the Town's Master Plan of 2005. Um, I'll now turn over the presentation and details to uh, Chris Huntress to discuss the project. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Chris Huntress uh, with Huntress Associates and Huntress Sports. We're landscape architects out of Andover, specializing in design of athletic facilities and recreation facilities. Uh, and keep going. I just get generally in the audience. I just hand up. I don't want to talk over them. Uh, yeah, you need to keep going. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is take you through uh, a series of uh, plans this evening. I'll take you through the existing conditions. I'll take you through the layout. And I'll stop and answer any questions that you might have. We'll certainly go into the details beyond that. Um, Henry, Henry, are you going to flip through yes. plans up here? Can I get to existing conditions, which should be the next question. If, if you, as you see it here, you can scroll up just a touch more. There you go. Um, track and, Sorry. <laughs> track and field is located. Uh, just, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to hit you with my later. The, um, is right over in this area, and you come across, uh, you know, gravel road to get over to what is now the lower fields. The lower fields encompass two baseball fields. You can see the outline of, a, of an infield here that plays out this way, and the outline of an infield uh, here, which again plays out here. 
the outfields are used as many are and uh, from what we purpose for you can see a soccer field layout here another soccer field layer here layout in this orientation and then you've got some ancillary uh this, this is a discus cage that throws in this direction and a shop put area that throws back here once you get back into the woods um, there's some heavier tree cover in here but it's, it's clearly been pre-disturbed there's a lot of um, changing sudden changing grade back there in pile of it's been moved over a little bit of time um, to the north of the site runs the uh, MBTA uh, rail line right away. And um, south of the site here is, is Codway Road, uh, right in this location. And the balance of the property uh, to the south and to the east is owned by Austin Prep. Um, as we get down, I'm going to talk about the wetland system for just a little bit. We had the, the survey, it's recent. The wetland flags were done uh, just this spring. They were delineated by DeRosa Environmental out of Raleigh. Um, they have uh, established a wetland line that comes up uh, and through and into a portion of the existing fields and through this area. So it's not just um, beyond the tree line. The wetland system actually does come a little bit into what is now existing fields uh, as planned by the Rosa. The floodplain elevation sits, uh, the 100 year floodplain sits at elevation 83, which is right along this, this line that you see here, which kind of bumps up and around it goes off the plane a bit there. But, um, that becomes important as we start to talk about grazing and drainage and so on. Like, you know, okay, so mm -hmm. the edge of that took a Sorry, go one more. Yep. There we go. So this plan is a layout materials plan, and this shows uh, the new proposed improvements on top of the existing conditions that we just talked about. For orientation, this is the, um, the causeway gravel road that we built from the tracks. This is the average on the river, uh, entry for the wetland system that we discussed. And that finger of wetland comes right up into this area here. Uh, and that's part of the baseball field. MBTA line again uh, to the north here, and the length of six tennis courts uh, right in this location. The, uh, the majority of this um, design revolves around the development of a full-size uh, varsity baseball field, uh, which will be synthetic turf. It has a uh, you know, full baseball infield, 305 feet, I believe, to the, um, to the foul line, uh, right field, and longer, uh, 330 feet plus um, down the, uh, the, the left field line here. You will see that there's a multi-purpose field that's overlaying across the top of the baseball field. Um, to provide that again, that, that mixed use that was down there before. Before we had two baseball fields with uh, overlap in the outfield, we've gone to one baseball field and one uh, soccer field that is synthetic turf, so it can handle a lot more use. The other part that, um, that we've shown right over here is a baseball infield. This will be a natural uh, clay and natural grass baseball infield. It does not have the full outfield components, as this is your, your forested edge right in through here. But the school's desire was to be able to have a baseball infield. They, they had two baseball fields there before. They want to be able to run an infield practice while another team is using the larger field and then switch back and forth between varsity and JV. So that will be a baseball infield, not a full, a full outfield. Um, some of the things that happen around the baseball field and the tennis courts, we've got uh, a walkway system that comes once you get across um, the causeway here. It's a 10-foot walkway that comes down and around and brings access over the tennis courts. The tennis courts have a tennis court pavilion building here, which is effectively a long porch uh, with a middle structure that is enclosed. Behind that would be a, a baseball grandstand and press box system that sit right in through here. Uh, all the structures, and, the, and when I say structures, I include the tennis courts in that, sit outside of the 30-foot setback. Uh, this line that you see here, this coasted line is the 30-foot setback line. This is your property line right here. Same thing up here. That's the heavy one's property line and the lighter line. Right through here that is the uh, setback line. We've met with your building inspector, um, Andrew, and uh, some of your other town representatives to go over some of our questions about things like what kind of structure as we get in setbacks. Those kind of things we're, we're quite sure that we know and understand what your building inspector is going to be looking for. There we go. On the baseball field itself, uh, we've got dugouts uh, on either side, uh, first and third baseline. We've got bullpens that sit just beyond those that are here. Uh, and <coughs> we've got a batting cage that sits in this location just north of the baseball field, which is predominantly in the same location as the existing batting cage, but it's just been pulled to be outside again at 30 foot um, setback. So the existing one is within the 30 foot. We've pulled the new one to be outside of it. 
And then the only final structure we have here would be a uh, storage shed, 16 feet wide, 36 feet long, um, shingled uh, fire structure with a couple of barn doors on it. It's for storage of athletic equipment uh, for, the, for the use of the fields. Yeah. Both facilities, being the baseball field and the tennis facility, have lighting associated with them. The baseball field and soccer field here have seven sports light poles that are located around the perimeter. Um, they are all, again, all outside of the 30-foot uh, setback, um, and it does take seven to hit a photometric plan. We did include a photometric analysis in the submission. Admittedly, the photometric analysis that was provided showed the limit of the playing field itself. I asked our, our, uh, our engineer to expand that to show what they call zero grade all the way up the top of the to show you where we get zero. What we are proposing here for lighting system is a muscular lighting system. It is an LED system. I can tell you in, in working with it in this industry for 25 years, I have not a muscular sales rep, but they make the best sports lighting in the industry. And their cutoff and glare is, is uh, phenomenal. We can show you some local installations of their LED fixture. We just did one at Paramount College at their track and field. I'd have to go over and show you how dramatic that cutoff is. There is lighting as well at the um, tennis courts, which are, it's called high mass lighting. It's 40 foot tall light poles. Um, there are, I'm gonna say six uh, light poles at the tennis court facility. Um, for light, for light tennis. I guess with that, I will stop. I can, I can go to Radiant Grange. I can go to the details. If we all answer any questions. Um, it would if you can, just one minute. Okay. Um, so the process is that um, the applicant will go through um, uh, their presentation, the board will ask questions, and then we'll open it up to questions from the public. Just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that. So, sorry. Well, the, I'm not, could you give us a um, quick chronology? Of the work that's been done below the field. I mean, I was a member of the board when you came in and did the artificial turf on the football field okay. yeah. first. And there was no tennis courts, no baseball diamonds, none of the other stuff. So you, you've done an awful lot of work uh, between then and then. Uh, can you just give us a quick chronology of the uh, spreading, if you will, of the athletic facility? So uh, I will do my best. I was not involved in the original project of the, the football field. However, these baseball fields have always existed, and the site has tennis courts now. The tennis courts are up on the on the uh, upper portion of the uh, of the campus near the parking lot. Okay, you know. As I remember, I toured the site at the time, and it was basically woods between the football field and the, the, the railroad track. The, the issue, David, is that unless you go down the hill and, th and through the path, Correct. you don't know there's a baseball field down there. So it's been there. It's been there for been there for a long time. Yeah, yeah, and and you just wouldn't know it unless you knew it. So okay. you can see them on Causeway if you go to yes. the end of the circle yeah. there. Okay, my confusion. It's okay. Uh, the other the other question I had is I looked through the uh, information that we got online and it said five tennis courts, but the diagrams all show six. So I was curious as to which was the there are six tennis courts. From the board. I have a couple questions, I guess. Um, so I understand that the cutoff will make the photometric do something, but we're talking about a, a 90 foot mast. Yes. Right, so it was about a 10 foot grade change, I think, from bottom of wall to top of wall. Looks like you have a retaining wall there along the. You're talking about the tennis court here? Yeah. Sure, the tennis court actually as well. The tennis court has a, looks like a grade of 84. Yep. Four and a half for the surface. And the steepest cut, which is right here, is about a nine foot cut right in that corner. And that's a 50 foot mast. Um, so 40 feet of that is above above the surface, let's say. Right. 40 feet above. With, um, with Moscow, who's designing those, it would be my intention to locate that, that pole at the bottom of the, of the uh, grade, not the top of the, not the top of the. Yeah, I took the 10 feet off. Right, right 50 foot mast. 
10 foot grade chain, so 40 feet of that is visible, let's say, from the neighbors. Correct. So I'm, I'm wondering how a photometric can account for the source, right? I understand that it'll cut off, but there'll still be a source of light up there. You will, we can, so that's an excellent point. So we can show you photometrics that will show that there's zero, zero by the time we get the property line, or even more in advance of that. But what we can't do is stop somebody from looking out their window and seeing a light source over there. It won't be a light in the property, but they'll certainly be able to look over and see it, and it's true. Okay, and because the other ones are 90 feet high, and Those so that's on the baseball field, that would be 90, that would be 80 feet roughly from, say, Causeway, maybe 70 feet. So there's a tree line there, and I'm wondering how deep into the tree line you have to impact to put the wall in. Uh, very little. I mean, if I could get you, Andrew, to scroll up and show me the corner of the right field of the baseball field. What's that coming up? There you go. Um, the tree line runs right about through here. So the only area that we're actually cutting trees on the site is right in this location. Right here, and that's about a six foot grade change for that wall. Make right field work at, uh, at 305. Okay. And I guess the last question I have is more about the baseball field. So the entire surface is artificial, including the what would typically be the sand, the dirt part of it. Yes, the infield. The infield. Correct. And the mound. The mound is a uh, the mound will be a portable mound, and okay. it's, it's a synthetic mound with a the clay tray that sits in to manufacture by So that's removed when you're using the multi-purpose field. So during baseball season, there'll be a portable mound out there, and when the baseball season's over, they want to use the soccer the mound comes out. Okay. Seems like the soccer fields always suffer. <laughs> you would never put this in the middle of a football field. I just happened to break my ankle in the field. Just like this. Not very much fun. When we take it away, uh, yeah. the turf runs right under the, the uh, portable okay. pitch mount. So it, when we take it away, it gets regroomed and it's almost like it was never there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Anything? No, it's hard for me to. So, um, I guess my um, uh, the thing I I don't want to call it a concern, but uh, the thing that that jumps out at me is um, is really the impact. Um, right to me, well, I'm looking at the impact of the neighbors, um, and I have heard that. Um, uh, neighbors from the football field um, read that interestingly enough the lights haven't been a concern but what's really been a concern there is the um, is the announcement system at night the sound system at night um, and um, well the sound system in general but right you, you people people are more aware of it um, at nighttime um, and uh, and and that was a dramatic change for for those folks, um, and so um, so I'm thinking about this in that same context, and note that the the grant the baseball grandstand will be about 11 feet high, um, or above the ground I should say, um, and the embankment for the railroad is. Um, a little less than that. It's about six or seven feet. Um, and so the, the activity on that grandstand where the, where the um, um, well, at the top of the grandstand um, will then now be even with the folks that um, are over across the, the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. um, and where right now all of that noise, all of the, the baseball activity that happens there is um, is sheltered um, uh, because of the railroad embankment. Um, and, and then you sort of have that same, uh, 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 um, certainly there was <laughs> really much activity down where the, where the tennis courts um, are now. Um, and, and, and I presume that there will be quite a bit of activity there. Um, not uh, sh shouldn't I, I wouldn't expect it to be all that uh, offensive or anything, but it will definitely be. Um, it, it will sports, be. A, there's not a lot of alternate use for the tennis. Uh, tennis is tennis. Tennis is tennis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Soccer, yeah. Play um, so so I guess that's really the thing that I, I would um, <coughs> urge you to to think about is 
um, is that that noise um, I, I assume that at some point you're going to have some sort of PA system um, and, and you know you, you don't note it here but um, but right that that will happen you yeah, know you don't spend a, two million dollars on, on a baseball field and, and not have a PA system we, uh, um, there so. would be a PA system and if you like I'll talk, I'll talk about it briefly um, we do a lot of athletic fields and stadium mm -hmm. facilities uh, oftentimes we don't we don't just this issue we yeah. just did one for the um, for the uh, for another client and uh, and it was uh, in a historic district neighborhood um, there was a lot of concern what we what we did there and what we would do here is we wouldn't have one speaker that would be mounted on the top of the press box we'd probably have a system with eight different speakers and they'd be controlled in pairs so you could have two that would be on either side of the, on either eve of the press box and they're smaller speakers and they would speak directly to the crowd that's sitting in the, in the, in the grandstands themselves and then we could have other speakers that were on the sports light poles that typically go around the rest of the stadium that are intended for the field purposes, whether it be soccer mm -hmm. or baseball. The important part of that is that they can be controlled in pairs and both volume and on or off. And that you can control, there's a lot of control in the system to be able to tone down and bring it down to the volume that's needed. So um, many communities work with clients just like this to talk about things like hours of operation for the sound system what would be the last time you know in the evening that it would be on that time, how many times a year uh, it would be on past an hour of say you know eight or nine o'clock tonight that kind of thing so um, we're certainly happy to get into that with you as we go forward in the process um, and then I guess it coupled with that I guess uh, my uh, thing that I would encourage you with whether you can put up some you know it probably doesn't even need to be very high uh, eight foot fence or something in that area where the stands are between the stands and the in the railroad tracks um, it, you know to, to cut off that activity the noise um, from there I, it's not it's actually right idea. so there's an existing chain link fence I believe that runs at the top of the grid yeah. along the MBTA yeah. right away. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure who owns that, whether it's the MBTA. It would probably be the MBTA, school. yeah. But well, we could put another one next to it that would be a solid board fence. I mean, I, really because you're just you really only have to I'm going to say protect against right where that that grandstand is because that's really the, the place where the noise would be generated so um, uh, and then I guess th my my other question is you provided um, not in this packet but sort of this overview somewhere um, I saw online you, you also had um, had uh, something about the softball fields is that is that the piece that you said you don't have? Yeah, uh, that, that's still one first. Maybe. Maybe. Another. Okay. Yeah, All right. We have to have the money for that. Okay. Have the money. Have to right. So uh, that's a dream, uh, but we're not. Uh, it sounds like a Title IX issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, softball fields are not be located in the proximity of the field. Uh, 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 I, I was absolutely right. serious about that, by the way. I know. Yeah. I know. So, soccer and women's sports? <laughs> so, <laughs> Just for that? Women can play the baseball and they can play How many women are on the baseball team? I think JP actually runs a women's baseball team. Do they? Yeah. Yep. No, I was too proud. What? JP. Oh. Hey, um, no. I'm sorry, Mr. Pollard. Athletic <laughs> director. So, um, <clears throat> the other thing, do we want to suggest um, speaker sighting? Basically, prohibit speaker that would um, face the railroad side. Um, well, I, I guess. It, it, Perhaps. Um, it like they would, though, because if the press box is facing home plate, let's say, right? Probably mounted on the press box. I guess my question is, where are you in in the process? We're very early in the process. Yeah, so... We've so met with you, the town several times. We've done the DRT. Um, we're working with the town on some concerns we've had with drainage and conservation. We still have to go to conservation. Um, we expect that we're going to have some modifications to this plan that will be coming back to you folks. Right. At least, figure probably more time. All right. So with with that, I guess you've heard what we, what, as a board, we've we've um, we've 
said, and I would hope that you'd come back with some um, sort of um, response, not a formal response, but incorporate those as uh, as the, the plan evolves. Um, and if that's all right with the board, with that, I'll open it up to the public. I do have a comment. Certainly. Should I state my name again? No, that's okay. Okay. Hello? The train, the railroad uh, across the track, so there, that's one line. I know that they're adding another, or they have the goal to add another line, one to go north. So I do know that's sort of been coming out of the pipeline. Another problem is um, the, the swampy area that you're looking at here. I just feel like in general, we need to be more careful about these swamp lands or wetlands that the more and more we, we push against wetlands, the more flooding is going to happen. I, we keep thinking we can defeat, you know, our, our environment, but it's going to come back, you know, I think, on us if we keep building on wetlands. Eventually, we're just going to keep removing earth and just it's going to lead to more flooding. And I think that's something to think about is all the flooding that we're going to cause. How do you, what, and I'm just wondering how you plan on addressing the wetlands, the flooding. Because the more you cut down trees, you know, those tree roots are not, you know, soaking up water, and that water is going to come back to us. It's just going to keep flooding and flooding and flooding the more that you take away from wetlands. So the more you remove trees from the area, the more flooding it's going to cause. I would like to see you be able to leave the trees as they are, but. That's just a thought. Um, I guess I'll say uh, two things. One is I do know that they are staying off the railroad right of way, or e even actually moving things further away from the the railroad right of way, um, which leaves the MBTA plenty of space to do whatever they're. So they're going to have the two. E even with additional tracks, they they they'll have space there, um, and and um, related to the wetlands and those issues, um, there is another process that goes along um, concurrently, <laughs> um, somewhat concurrently with this process, with the. Um, um, with the Conservation Commission, um, and they are, um, I'm going to say, have a uh, uh, more of an expertise um, and um, and a directive actually from the state to uh, to review the the issues that that you brought up about um, about wetlands and tree removal and those sorts of things. So I would suggest that that that's the forum. That sounds for, beautiful. To all me. right, great. Other questions, comments? Sure. Steve, my name. Yes, please. Like stand up. No. Steve Marisolo, um, live three Pilgrim Road. I would be one of those that live on the other side of the tracks. Uh, what I would start off with is, I'm a physical educator. Certified athletic trainer for 25 years. I've worked on every level, professional, Olympic, collegiate, high school, and middle school. So I'm not opposed to a turf field. What I'm opposed to is the lights. What I got, well, six or seven questions. Question one kind of relates to of the school board and the lights. First off, how many lights? I was not opposed to the football field. But as we know, in the fall, when the leaves drop, the lights come through. I have a nine and a five-year-old. I go to bed at 7.30. For me, the noise, the band, the chair. As an educator, as an athletic trainer, I'm all for it. Sports, education, athletics go hand in hand. But again, when the leaves drop, the natural boundary is gone. The lights come through. My boy going to bed at 7, both boys going to bed at 7.30 is now 9, 9.30 because of the band, because of the lights. Not opposed, but again, the natural boundary is dropped. The scoreboards, how many scoreboards? Which way will the scoreboard be facing? The scoreboards light up green, red, yellow, also white. So how many scoreboards are we talking about? Why the needs for so many tennis courts? They already have tennis courts in the front. Reading Public has tennis courts down by the high school. Why an additional six more tennis courts? 
which just seems a lot to me. They already have tennis courts. They talked about the field being lined just for soccer. As a professional, I know that field would probably be lined for also field hockey and lacrosse, boys and girls. That's a multi-purpose field used for many things. Again, I'm not opposed to athletics. I'm opposed to the lights. My fourth question would be from the natural boundary. I do live on the line of the other side of the dead end. I've had foul balls in my yard. I've had foul balls hit my garage. Again, I'm not opposed. It happened. My boys go out and collect the foul balls and throw them back over. It's great. But do they have any plans to put in natural, more trees, shrubbery, natural boundaries, natural landscaping? Fifth question. You're adding in these lights as an educator, lights at night, bringing kids. Kids on those tennis courts late at night. Now we've got kids with idle time underneath lights, more places. Will the lights be on timers? I can tell you, the school that I work at, yeah, the lights are supposed to go off on Friday night at 10.30 after a football game. There's plenty of times I've walked out of my training room, my locker rooms, 11, 11.30 after treatments, and those lights are still on. Those lights can be on until 2 in the morning sometimes. People forget the lights stayed on. I get it. But as a father, I don't want those lights on until 2 o'clock in the morning. Number six, <clears throat> well, was how many lights? How many times? And finally, the noise in the PA system. As someone who does work in physical education, in the gym, outside, I can tell you, you can wire those up for two at a time, two at a time, two at a time. But again, who's going to be in charge of shutting off four out of those six? So there's only two. The PA system coming on. Today alone, I could hear the lacrosse game going on. Again, I'm not opposed to sports, but I could hear those lacrosse games going on. Then they were on the football field, across the south fields, or across all that, across the railroad tracks, and there's my house. So again, I'm a little nervous or a little leery of there's such a big project coming in to a smaller area with two young boys who already are attracted to those train tracks. You know, you got safety now coming in. There's a lot of little kids on my street. I've talked to all my neighbors. My road is, is a turnover road. We have multiple little kids on our road right now. And then one of the biggest concerns is the railroad tracks. So now you have railroad tracks, but now you open that up. My little boys play sports constantly. But they're the ones who are going to want to be over on that turf field playing soccer, football, watching, throwing the football, flying kites, hitting baseballs, whatever. So it's, it, it attracts little kids, which is a danger from those trains. So I'm not opposed. I'm more opposed to the lights and the timing of it. That's the taxpayer here in Reading. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Steve Chapman, for the record. I live at 66 Causeway Road. I'm with me and my wife, Carol, and my next door neighbor, neighbor Julie Wallace, from 60, 60 Causeway Road. Um, the school was nice enough to have the neighborhood over on May 28th, and we expressed all of our concerns to the school at that time. I'll say I'm speaking probably mostly for myself, but also we've met as a neighborhood group, and I think they share a lot of the similar concerns. And they've asked me to sort of be the neighborhood representative for Causeway Road. You can see from the plan, Causeway Road is the direct abutter of this development. Causeway Road is the most, I feel, impacted by this plan. I'd like to point out a couple of things for clarification. I appreciate the commission picking up on the fact that the application letter mentioned five courts, when in fact there are six, except the fact now that there are six. I would also like to point out, and I want to take exception to the fact that the application letter states that there would be no negative impact from lighting expected. I'm sorry if I may back up. There is a statement in the letter that says that the fields will not change in the use. And I, I'd like to find that if you're there with me.
It is anticipated that the uses of the improved field will be consistent with the current use of the existing fields. I don't understand how that can be when the existing fields are much smaller, there are no tennis courts in the lower area, and the new fields are proposed to be lighted. I asked the schoolmaster whether they would be renting fields out. He said that there's discussions of others using the fields. I heard that also this evening, that there's consideration of the fields being used maybe by town sports, or maybe other towns or other leagues coming in. To me, that is not a consistent use with the current activities on that field. The applicant's representative was talking about minimal tree damage, minimal tree impacts. He specifically pointed out the right field, saying that how minimal the tree impacts would be. I want to draw attention to the commission at the properties along Causeway Road, particularly at the tennis courts. There was mention made of the wall being nine feet tall. I believe the top of the wall is shown at 95. I think the court elevations are at 84. I believe that's 11 feet. The light poles will be, I think I heard, 50 feet, projecting up to 40 feet above the grade of that wall. 40 feet, 50 foot, 50 foot mass lights, 40 feet above grade, that's what I heard. Certainly that would be an impact. To go back to the tree issue, if you could scroll the slide to the properties along Causeway Road. The current plan, it was pointed out that the heavy line is the property line. The current plan depicts a limit of work less than 15 feet off of that property line. And the statement on the plan says that with no limit of work, all clearing shall be done, all materials be removed, and it will be graded out such that they can put the wall in. I'm paraphrasing, you could not talk about the wall in that limit of work. But clearly, in order to build a 10 plus foot wall and its foundation, they're going to have to cut back that slope to build the wall. They make the point of saying the wall is 30 feet off the property line because it's considered a structure. I don't disagree with that. It is 30 feet off the property line. Limit of work is about 15 feet. If you go back in this corner, this happens to be my lot, this is the Wallace lot. The tree line in the Wallace lot comes to about here. This is all heavy, mature trees all the way out to the railroad. We're concerned with the lighting impacts that has been discussed. We're concerned with the visual impacts. We're moving all the trees along the rear properties of Causeway Road. Not all, most of the trees. At the rear of the properties of Causeway Road, it will open up a visual line to the railroad. Removal of the trees will also result in additional noise levels to the rear of our property. What I was not able to determine from the plan set, which I reviewed online, is what the profile of that wall will be. It shows the top of wall, bottom of wall, in the corner where it turns 90 degrees. But the existing grades intercept that wall. Excuse me. Again. If you look at the contours here, that is a very steep slope going down to where they're showing the wall to be. So I would like to see what the profile of the wall is going to be, what the surface treatment will be at the rear of the wall to the limit of work at the clearing line. It was talked about sound and visual. I'd be interested in knowing what type of amenities we put on top of that wall to attenuate sound and visual impacts. Mention was made by the representative that the audio system will be on a volume control. I believe all audio systems are on volume controls. I believe the new football stadium is on volume controls. If anything, of all of the abutters, we on Causeway Road are probably the furthest from the football field. However, we still sit in our house with the windows and doors closed and we can see and almost uh, feel, we can hear and almost feel 
the audio coming to the new football stadium. The headmaster tells us it's because they were testing the sound and it was all on the scoreboard. And it's re my interpretation is that it was reverberating off the stands in the school and the hill because it's all pointing out in one direction. They tell me the system at the new field will be different. Tonight's the first time I heard about the dual speakers and the direction of the speakers. I am concerned <coughs> about hearing additional speakers on the mass lights and how loud will they be. I was happy to hear that they're planning on bathroom facilities because I saw nothing on the plans about sewer and water. And I believe the regulations require sewer and water facilities. So I don't know how they're dealing with that. I raise concern that this is quite remote from the campus. And whether they have the same level of activity, or I believe it will be increased activity, not only at the ball field, but at the way the tennis courts. And that presents the problem of parking. The school tells me they're gonna park at the campus and walk back. As being direct about it, as I can say, on limited occasions, we've had folks just going through our yard to get down to the Austin property. If the tennis courts are here, and you're expecting folks to walk all the way from the upper campus along this path around the baseball field to come to the tennis courts, is that gonna be reasonable? I probably have other comments in my, my notes. I think I've said enough. I didn't mean to reiterate a lot of what was being said and heard. But I did want to go on the record to say those concerns. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to add one more comment. Certainly. Okay. Certainly. I wanted to reiterate that taking down those trees would cause flooding. I would really like to leave the trees alone. I think that that helps a lot um, to avoid flooding. Am I right? Do you think? I will not comment. But I will not comment on the flooding. Mm -hmm. I would, as one of my notes, I would like to comment. Is that again, in the plan set, I did not see any information on warnings of groundwater. But I was watching how the proposed drainage system may function with putting in a rain garden two to three feet lower than existing grade. They're proposing an extensive underdrain system below the field. And then in the filtration area, they've got a two foot depth of crushed stone below the synthetic field. So the bottom of that infiltration is going to be at least three feet below finished grade. The details they show for the infiltration structures from the rim elevation to the bottom of the sump in the infiltrator is five feet. You get out of that field pretty much any time of the year, and the weapons are right there. That's why they are weapons. I question where is the groundwater and how these drainage systems are going to work. It, 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 said yeah. that I'm an engineer who specializes yeah. in stormwater. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think, as they said, right, you, you still have a, a bit to go working on the um, drainage, drainage system. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Now, we do have full borings of geotech and we know the ground water. Mr. Chairman, I hate to keep going on, but one other thought is it was mentioned that there's a meeting with Conservation Commission to get the input or direction from Conservation Commission. Yep. I'm wondering if those have been public meetings. I'm not sure if we've been noticed those meetings. Uh, I, I'm sure they have because all, all I don't meetings. Think the five are, you filed yet? Uh, they haven't filed. They, yet. Okay, so yeah, they haven't filed yet. But if they do occur, they absolutely will be yeah, public I, meetings. I purposely did not comment about the wetland being because a it's member of conservation commission. I know they have paved surfaces regarding the wetlands and impacts the wetlands. Understood. Just to uh, highlight some of the concerns, if you look at the contours for the fifth and sixth uh, tennis court, there's 13 and a half feet of elevation from the 30 foot setback line to where the surface of the tennis court will be. 
the 96 foot elevation at the property line and it's like 83 uh, down where the tennis court would be. What's the what's your thinking about protecting the edge of the retaining wall? Is there going to be a fence on the top? Yeah, yeah, it required it. The, the building code would require fence. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if the fence was going to be on the property line or at the wall. So there's no fence along the property line. It's just it's open. Not as currently proposed, but there would need to be a fence at the top of the wall. Yep. And on the baseball side too, right? Any, anywhere that changing grade is more than three feet, or where is it, three feet. And then I guess, I guess, um, see, I don't mind the noise coming from these fields. Uh, I live near one of the parks, and you know, I can, and it's actually not that close, and I can hear the activity going on. To me, that's just part of a community noise. But if we're going to put these tennis courts in here, and you're going to be renting this out, I think there probably has to be some understanding about what the hours for the rental portion of that would be. So beyond the use of the school, beyond how the school uses it, I think there should probably be some understanding of what that is. I don't know if that should be something that would run, say, you know, a 24-hour tournament, for example, you know. Uh, but regular use by the school, to me, is not offensive. And then who would so <clears throat> I thought the parking issue was a pretty important one. Kind <laughs> of thinking about how close everyone needed to park to the country club, you know, when the parking lot mm -hmm. was just there anyway. So <clears throat> there without restrictions there will definitely be people on Causeway Road cutting through people's backyards. So who do they work with? Is it the police or is that the select board? Because <clears throat> it just, there's, it's human nature to go close, closer. Do you know where, have you ever gone to Causeway? No, I know. It's, it's hard to get to in the first yeah. place, but, but, but there humans seem to part. need to find that. I, I guess, I guess track. from, from my experience, because I've been down on that site when there's been a lot of people down there and, um, uh, two feet, two baseball games going on, lots of parents, lots of people, um, with only one baseball field there, putting the tennis courts aside. Um, they all, I think they prime, I mean, they don't, you don't have people parking on Causeway Street um, on a regular basis and cutting through, do you? A regular basis, no. No. I, I, um, I mean, I, I rode down there on Sunday and kind of stood at the edge of the circle. I didn't, admittedly didn't walk down there. It looked like there was a drop-off, so I didn't think it was going to be something somebody could do, but you may want to consider some sort of determent. I don't know. if the, I guess the fence and the drop would be part of it. Yeah. Uh, also, I don't think the lights would be on all night, so... You know, they have to be off, and you have to call when you see them on after a certain hour. That's, that's the way it's going to work. I can tell you from experience, the lights, someone forgets to shut them off. Oh, Janitor, you know, custodian. Lights cost money to run. I understand that, but I can tell you from experience, yeah. two towns away that I worked for, those lights will be on, and they'll be on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that's a major concern. Yes. People forget. Yeah. So Rachel, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I just want to provide that perspective. That just, there, I mean, there are, at, there are, they're I, taking in ideas. I think I, that yeah. they should definitely figure out what is it that they can do to make it not attractive to park there, whatever it ends up yeah. being. Because I would agree. you know, yeah. I think particularly if the rentals are there, so people aren't even used to where you're supposed to go in the parking lots. They're just gonna find the shortest route to those um, tennis courts. Yeah. Particular. <clears throat> Other comments, questions, concerns for the moment? Well, I'm not a lighting engineer. Could you have the lower poles and you had more lights? If you lower the, so that's exactly it. If you lower the poles, you have more, you have more poles to get the same coverage. What's unique about this field 
is that it's a baseball field. It's a very far distance across farther than you would typically have on, say, a rectangular football field. We only need four lights. That's why you need seven to get around this, this field. If we drop the lights to, say, six or seven feet, we're going to have to add holes to make it. So that may not hit the middle of the field if we go through this hole. So there's like a safety that. aspect, is what you're saying. There is. Making sure there's enough lighting to yeah, catch so them off. The, the things that are critical when we light athletic facilities, particularly baseball, is the, is the infield. We're, we're watching out for the smaller, harder ball, uh, lacrosse and, uh, and baseball and softball. And uh, so those areas need to be let's at least 50 foot candles. And that's what our target has been throughout the entire facility. I'll continue to work with Musco and find ways that we can be a little more efficient on the lighting and work then with a better photometric plan that goes all the way to the property. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't think anyone brought that up because you stated it, but that was something that at first, when I looked at this application, I was like, I would need that. Yeah, I, I would like to address government's comment about the, the timing of the lights. Um, with this system that we're proposing, you can lock in the, the timing a year in advance. So we could program these to go off every night at a set time. And that's the time that they go off unless somebody manually changes it. To, and it would have to be somebody with access, maybe the athletic director or somebody else that's got access to it would be the only one that could turn it on for a long period of time. So you can certainly work with you on time. Right. Well. <coughs> I'm Jim Nicky, I'm the headmaster of Austin Prep, and that is current conditions for our uh, lighting system on the, on the stadium line. So every night they're set by time and go off no later than 9.30. Um, Football games run later than 9.30. And I've come home from Melrose on a Friday night and driven by Austin Prep, and those lights are still on. And my football game is over, and those lights are still on. I, I can just, I'm telling you from experience. I, we're not going to, yep, to yep. we're not going to solve that issue right here, right tonight. Um, but we understand the, the concern. Um, uh, and so I guess with that, right, we'll continue this. You have some work to do, uh, certainly on uh, with conservation. Um, you've heard co comments from us um, and would expect that the next version incorporates some of those, addresses some of those comments. Um, so do we have a... Do we, do you have... Um, a, so we'll keep you posted. We're going to do some changes, but the, the um, conservation, we don't have a date yet. We have to close the All right. All right. So we, we do want to you do want us to continue to continue to July and not skip a month. If you if you yep. could, okay. but, um, I will let you know as soon as All right. possible whether we're going to be able to hit that right. or not. <laughs> There's a lot of things on that agenda already. That's the challenge. Can we have a target time slot? Um, I mean, we could do like 7.45 or 8 o'clock. Okay. Move that the CPDC continue the public hearing for the site plan review application for Austin Prep School field work until Monday, 8 July 2019 at 8 p.m. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I don't know. I'm going to continue to look. If they're scheduled for the hearing on their continuation on the 8th, when would they be expected to be submitting additional material, and when will that material be available? Up until the week before the hearing, and I will work to post it. So July 1st. Yes, so it'll be a tricky week due to the holiday and more, um, but that would be the goal. So. Thank you. Please do subscribe to the agenda so you can see if they are on the agenda or continued. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Did you promise? That was why. That's highly doubtful. Highly doubtful. Yeah. So we'll just.
So as I noted before, um, the, uh, there's two items that were continued. Um, the next one on the agenda, 135, 139, 149 Howard Street. Um, that's to be continued July 8th at the request of the applicant. Do we have a... It's 815. Do, do we need to... Motion, motion. so moved to 815. Second. All right, all those in favor? You guys are fast. Um, 258 262 Main Street um, uh, requested to be uh, continued to July 8th at yeah I have um, 830 a number of these we don't expect are going to yes yes that's yep. the date yep. that we've <laughs> opened next meeting all right so moved go ahead all right <laughs> all those in favor yep yeah. all right um next item is um well right the next three items are um uh zoning bylaw amendment discussions um the first one well are this is this a hearing yes, yes. so it's not a discussion it's a, it's a, a, discussion. Yeah. It's a yes. hearing yes we have public hearing mm -hmm. we have public notice that's right. why there's all the hearing all right i want to split those up so we Robin. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Next time we'll combine them all into one. Yeah. Like one thing to do. Can we open all of them at once, or do we have to actually wait for a time? Um, Beyond the time. Well. Yeah, you can close. Yeah. Really close. Yeah, really so close. Yeah. <laughs> third one. So. You can do the last at least. Well, I'll, talk, I'll talk real slow. Or we can <laughs> we can fill in. Um, we have a lot release thing we need you to vote on and sign. Well. Alright, well, why don't I do 8 45 and 9 o'clock? Yeah. Okay. Notice is hereby given that MGL Chapter 40A, Section 5, the Reading Community Planning and Development Corporate Commission, CPDC, will hold a public hearing in the Select Board's meeting room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., Monday, June 10, 2019, at 8 45 to consider the following proposed zoning bylaw amendments in advance of the November 2019 subsequent town meeting to amend section 5.6.5.3 by amending and relocating the definition of marijuana to sections 2.0 definitions and to also add the definition of hemp to section 2.0 definitions both as defined in the MGL Chapter 94G, Section 1. Complete drafts of the proposed amendments are available to the public in the Public Services Department in Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday, 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on the town website the Thursday prior to the hearing date. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah. Can you can you bring this up on the yes, screen? Let's just go on here. Because the legal action of yeah. regulations and investigation. Are taking and have interest. <laughs> I just I didn't know what I said. <laughs> Taught me, right? It is. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And so this um, has evolved some mm -hmm. through our discussions, um, now being uh, fairly succinct. Uh, <laughs> Reminded you with the 94G definitions. Yeah. How about we well. can have a question? Sorry? Well, the 
Chapter 94 G, Section 1 seems, seems to include or imply that hemp is a marijuana product. Um, it's a product from the genus cannabis, but it does not exceed 0.3 percent THC. Is it THC. Or per volume or weight of marijuana product? So I'm, I'm either they're accused or I don't understand. It's, it's the part of the plant with a THC level that does not exceed 0.3% on a dry weight basis or per volume or weight of the product. Worded a little weird. We didn't write it. Okay. Nor are we going to change it because, <laughs> because uh, when you yeah. look at the definition of marijuana, it says shall not include hemp. <clears throat> I understand, but <laughs> I, and I, I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless what they're trying to say is that um, that the weight of a marijuana product. Is, is like the standard for determining the concentration right. yes. of the tetrahydrate. Right. You know I mean? right. That's right. So like this stuff is flammable. One gallon of this stuff is flammable. Like gasoline. Kind of. Something like that. <coughs> As you say, we're not going to change it. But we're also not going to be expected to explain to that town. Yeah. And the council's going to be there to do Good. That. So, um, and, and so by adopting, right, essentially we're adopting um, the MGL, the Mass General Law, um, definitions of hemp and marijuana because right <coughs> now we have our own Reading based definitions of hemp and marijuana that may or may not be correct? We do not have not. a definition of hemp. Oh, there you go. We yep. have a definition of marijuana that um, may cross over. means that we prohibit literally every single product that can be derived from, from the cannabis genus. Oh. Yeah. And that puts us at odds with CBD being sold in products and with the agricultural exemption for um, hemp products. Um, cultivation, hemp cultivation. So. Uh, so this lines us up with the, essentially with state law. Mm -hmm. Right, and so then it's just a matter of whether it gets, whether the town wants these definitions or not. And if they want them, then we line up with state law. If they don't want them, then we have what we have now and we have to figure out how to regulate CBD products. And, and we might be cautioned by the Attorney General that we're running afoul of MGL chapter 48, section three. Yeah. Right. Okay. If we were to to have someone propose to cultivate hemp in town. Yes. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, questions from the public about the comments. <laughs> 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 All right. Hearing none. Or no, other hit me. No, no well, do we need so do we need to take action? Yeah. You need to make a recommendation. You vote on your recommendation if you are ready to be done conversation. So ready to be done. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> 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 we need to close the public hearing, then we need to. All right. Vote. Well, I have one question. Sure. It's probably for town council. So there's three options here. Option one, is, well, I guess there's only two now. So it's we pass the bylaw amendment. Mm -hmm. What happens? We don't pass it. What happens? Well, that's what I was just sort of explaining. So if the town meeting passes the bylaw amendment, mm -hmm. then we have new definitions. We have a new definition for marijuana, and we have a definition for hemp, and we would allow CBD products in town. Because right now, we don't. Because don't, of our definition We don't marijuana. allow marijuana sales, and therefore, because hemp, in our definition, is is part of the marijuana um, umbrella, 
we therefore don't allow anything derived from marijuana hemp. Which or, you pointed out. Yes, I know. Yep. So right. the question is, we don't pass it, what happens? Things right. stay the way they are and we have to <clears throat> promulgate regulations for CBD. If we want to continue having CBD if in we, town. No, because no. we would not be able to, like you pointed out. Right. So we would have to kick out any businesses we currently have and we would have to figure out a way to extract all products from stores that sell them yeah. and, and, and ongoing regulations. Make sure that they don't do it in the right. future. In a fair and even way, which Correct. could be very difficult. Yeah. And I, like I noticed in the, um, you know, in, in um, convenience stores, they sell CBD products. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere, yeah. So, oh. be interesting. Just, just want to understand the consequences of yeah. both mm -hmm. possibilities. It's good. <clears throat> this is a bigger improvement over the original, which was one to, to allow it, one to explicitly right. not yeah. allow it, <laughs> and then, well, if we don't vote for either one, what happens? <laughs> okay. Things stay the same. Right. That's so, right. short term, uh, what do we need to do? We need to close a public hearing. Move that we close a public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Right. Um, we need a um, motion to... Motion. Recommend to um, town meeting. Mm -hmm. so. Move that the CPDC uh, recommend the zoning bylaw amendment uh, for the mass to adopt the Massachusetts definition of marijuana and hemp. Um, Second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Are you seconding or are you asking for a second? Uh, I was asking for a second. Second. All those in favor? Hold on, I have a oh, question. Sure. Usually when we recommend language, we, we're close to town meeting, we have an article. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, we can, we can recommend this in its article form. Okay. For the warrant. Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, we're already seconded. All right. All those in favor? <laughs> no <case. Yeah. laughs> uh, Next one is footnote, footnote one. one. There we go. Notice is hereby given that the M un, that under MGL chapter forty A section five. The Reading Community Planning and Development Commission, CPDC, will hold a public hearing in the Select Board's meeting room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass., on Monday, June 10, 2019, at 9 p.m. to consider the following proposed zoning bylaw amendments in advance of the November 2019 subsequent town meeting. To amend Section 5.3, Table of Uses, by removing footnote 1, from Table 5.3.1, Table of Uses for Businesses, Business and Industrial Districts, and amending the language and placement to footnote 1 in Table 5.3.2, Table of Uses for Residential Districts. Complete drafts of the proposed amendments are available to the public in the Public Services Department in Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on the town website the Thursday prior to the hearing date. Thank you. So I apologize, Nancy, I did not add your comments yeah. to the packet. Um, I should have, I apologize for that, but. She's here. But we have proposed to remove footnote one from the business and industrial districts because it just doesn't make too much sense there. Um, and we have amended the table of uses for residential districts. We have um, added that anyone who wishes to do this must get a special permit from the ZBA uh, and that we cannot increase the structure by more than 10% of the dwelling. Um, so we've rewrote that a little bit to have a little more control over this leave and mm -hmm. 
Um, and uh, just, just to um, paint the picture here, the purpose of all this um, is because there was some confusion um, when it came to this particular footnote of what was allowable in terms of changing um, uh, additions, or not changing additions, about making additions to a home, what, what um, was, I'm gonna say, grandfathered in, what counted, what didn't count in order to, um, in this particular footnote. Right. Um, so. Among <coughs> other challenges. Yes. Right. Okay. A question I have. The footnote one uh, change in table 531 uh, removed the references to footnote one and renumbered the others. Mm -hmm. Did not change the footnote on business C multifamily dwelling. Well, there's a note right below it and adjust all footnotes in table 531 accordingly. Okay. There are eight other instances, so we would have to probably provide the whole table and show that. Okay. Uh, comments from the public? <laughs> <laughs> Start from that side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't have a problem with removing it. I really don't. And I don't have a problem going to the zoning board. I think that's a great idea because it gives another set of eyes over what's going on. So I don't have a problem with that. My concern is where does the 10% come from? And what does that include or not include? I mean, what is the point of it, I think? My comment to <coughs> Andrew when I was looking at this was that, you know, if someone, say you have the eight rooms, you qualify, you want to make it into a two-family, but you want to also add to both units a family room or you want to add a kitchen renovation or you want to do something special those two units we already have regulations that limit what someone can do on their lot so a lot of these houses happen to also be on very small lots to begin with so they're, they're going to be limited in what they can add on anyway because it's a 25 percent rule yeah. so i don't understand what the 10 percent includes is that for stairs is that for entryway yeah but if we're keeping it as a single family as part of the recommendation what is the 10% include that I mean in other words it has to look like a single family home right. so what gets us the 10% and if somebody wanted to say you've got two units and they wanted to add on a family room at some point does that forever limit them from renovating or adding on to their homes I, I'm confused as to why 10% and well, not, that? It's, it's not renovating, though. No. Say yeah. you have a case, uh, an old house that has just eight rooms and it's 1,200 square feet. So they can only add on 120 square feet. That may not even get them the front door, let alone a second stair out. So uh, explain to me why 10%. That's all. I think they're, it's kind of arbitrary, <coughs> I think, based upon each house being so different. Uh, the simple answer is that we didn't want it to be 50%. <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why not 12%? Yeah, That's a good not? question. Yeah, why not? I mean, I, I think if, you, if your goal is to keep it single family, if it were a single family, somebody could add on, mm. you know, a thousand square feet if they have the lot for it. What difference does it make? But the, I guess the goal isn't to keep the home single family. No, no, the look of a single family. Yes. Right? So whether it's 1,200 square feet today or it's 2,500 square feet, if they've got the property to make it 2,500 square feet, why are they limited to the 10%? I, and, and that's understanding yeah. that we yeah. don't want to change the look of it for the neighborhood. I get that, and I agree with that. I wouldn't want those homes to change either so that they look like their families everywhere when they weren't to begin with. But on the flip side, why does it have to be limited to 10%? Why can't you get to that same look? But it doesn't matter. It's kind of arbitrary from an architect's standpoint. Right. I so, well, I guess from that standpoint, right, you, you can say that. And this is, I think, what really drove the, the problems that with footnote one is that you and I might be able to agree um, uh, on what 
fits in with the neighborhood. Right. But then there's a whole bunch of developers um, that'll say, mm, you know, yeah, this fits in, and you know, and it's something that you and I would not consider, you know, fitting in. And so exactly. at some point, in some point, I, that's really what caused the issue is that there was a lot of ways around to ways around the the intent of the original um, uh, regulation and so what what why 10 percent was the idea is the idea was when you're converting from a single to two family there's something you're gonna have to do yeah, I don't well, know what is it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what it is. But I would but, say but that so that so that we didn't want to say no. When you convert from one family to two family, you can't do you can't add on any square footage. You can't do anything. That doesn't seem quite right. But we didn't want what was happening was we're converting it and then we're adding you know double the square footage in the back right. um, on one of the units well, and. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but That's the it. challenges that above a certain number, a certain percentage, it, it was getting really hard for people to retain the appearance of a single family home. Right, and that's where the CPA comes in, though, don't you? No, I do think that, but it, it started to feel very subjective and very arbitrary, and, we were, um, and that's partly why we went with a lesser amount. So I guess if you go back to you know, we've already got these bylaws for accessory apartments, and we're allowing a thousand square feet for an accessory apartment, mm -hmm. and that can be added on mm -hmm. with VA approval. And so, if I, it, it is a percentage of the square footage, which I do have another objection. But when you get to the, have that discussion, but um, I don't understand then what makes it different. That a two, the, the nice thing about a two-family, from an ownership standpoint, is that they could sell half of the house and then reap the benefit of being able to have two units on that piece of property. There are probably fairly few homes that meet this criteria. 900. 900. But that's if not, they add it on, a few. Uh, yeah. well, that is pretty few, I would say. Well, there's, right, there's 900 that meet the criteria, but of those 900, who could actually do, do something it. on their yeah. lot? And right. I'm going to guess that it's probably. 10% of the households. Yeah, there's about 9,000. Right, but, but think about it in terms of square footage of the lot. I mean, I think you're limited. I, I, my lot is so small, I can't even put a garage on it because of the 25%. I could put on an accessory apartment because they're exempt from the square footage requirements. Another issue with our bylaws. Well, you're limited to two-thirds of your... Right, but so what? You occupy those. I could have a you know, two-and-a-half-story house that has quite a bit of square footage. So all I'm saying is it's the 10%, I think, it, and I'm not, you know, obviously, I don't want a big, big production of all these either, mm -hmm. but I just think 10% is arbitrary. So in the past, in the past, there's been an abuse of this particular section where it's grossly over what the intent of this conversion was. You don't necessarily need two family conversions in single family neighborhoods. Um, and this was to sort of supply a way to make modest two family, modest units, not two McMansions jammed together. So, so could, you, could you limit it in a different way so that it's more in line with the accessory apartment bylaw and say that one unit no, because now you're talking, so, I don't know. I so ZBA just approved an accessory apartment, um, and I went to oppose their second driveway, because now it's going to operate like a two-family in a single-family neighborhood, which specifically we prohibit, but apparently we allow, uh, allow them, the ZBA variance on every single one of the paragraphs, including the two driveways, so. Well, the driveway is a different a different board. It has to go to the select board yeah. to get final approval on that, but right. they approve the application as it was proposed mm -hmm. okay. with two drivers. It starts to operate like a two-family now. So if you've got two thousand square foot apartments, right, that's a right. different animal than two thousand square foot multifamily, right? But more cars, more people. Sure. You're changing. You're changing the way that house is being used, regardless of what it looks like. Because anyone can, well, I take that back. <laughs> I was going to say anyone can design a nice house, but that is just not true. Uh, I think, I guess, yeah, I just, my concern is just the arbitrariness of 10%. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that's 
what does it take to convert? Is it a second stair? Do you want them to have decks at the back that are open with stairs down? Because is that 10% to get that secondary stair out of that? I mean, I'm thinking if you're converting it top and bottom, the second unit on the top needs two means of egress out of it. So they need to be able to have a common or a stair to go in, and you need to have a stair to go out. So is that 10% meant to have the stair that the secondary stair that goes out of it? You know, or does it mean that they can never add on anything else other than that 10%? It does not say it. It does not say that. Yeah. No. So they right. can put an application in and do a uh, two-story family room, mm -hmm. add on uh, another, say, 24 by 24 top and bottom to each unit, but the 10% then is what? The stair going out? And what's the difference then in that scenario? I don't understand. I mean, they're just adding a family room to each of the units. Well, there's where your problem lies. You're working off the assumption that it's a small house and they need to expand. The original purpose of the bylaw was to take the beautiful homes that were built in the 1920s with eight, 10, 12 rooms, what we call McMansions today, which were real mansions back then, and allow some sort of conversion so that somebody doesn't have to sell, you know, what would normally be a million dollar home for, you know, because you don't have that many people. You could actually convert that into, say, a two family. Now, I've seen a lot in Lawrence and Methuen that literally the outside stays 100%. They got the interior and they rebuild it as two condos. I've seen them actually do three and four, depending on the size of the original house. And that was the original intent, was to allow you to maintain a home. Well, all right, maybe you do need to add a stairs or add something else to make it livable. Maybe it was only eight rooms. In your 1,200 foot example, each of the eight rooms would have been 12 by 12 feet, which are tiny little rooms. You really can't convert that into a two family. You could. You'd end up with you know four rooms, a bedroom, a living room, a kitchen, and that'd be about it. <coughs> and maybe that's not a bad type of unit to have in our housing right. stock. No. But we wanted to make sure that people weren't going to come up to the window and go, well, I can put in a two-family because people were doing this. They were saying, okay, I can build it as a two-family, so let me tear it down and build it as a real two-family. Well, they can't do that. That's Right. Not. So now where's the limit? And what we were trying to do is say, okay, there may be times when you have to add on. Do we want to add on? Because really, these are homes that were probably 3,500 <coughs> to 5,000 square feet back then if you had eight rooms. The ones I so I, all I'm saying is that the temple. <coughs> I get it. I, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Believe me, mm -hmm. I understand it. If yeah. when I've worked on it, I've tried very hard to keep the same family view yeah. of it. <coughs> However, my point is, and this isn't just for this bylaw; it's for mm -hmm. a lot of bylaws mm -hmm. that we have. We come up with these somewhat arbitrary percentages that. I mean, I'd rather see it as a specific square footage, frankly, <coughs> because it works better that way. So if, if, it's, if you're trying to get a stair out, you're going to say, OK, you can add on 100 square feet. OK, fine, 100 square feet. Everyone can only add on 100 square feet. Why should a 3,500 square foot house be able to add on 350 square feet? That doesn't seem to me to make a lot of sense. So if we're limiting it, don't use a percentage, use a specific amount, but figure out what that amount should be. Because if it is for stairs, there are, to get up to a second floor, you need a certain amount of square footage to do that. But make it a level playing field for all of the houses out there that need to do this addition in order to convert it. I'm but, worried about, and it goes back, I'm sorry, yeah. it goes back to the uh, accessory bylaw. Why should a 3,500 square foot house or a 4,000 square foot house be allowed to add on in their property a uh, thousand square foot accessory apartment. It shouldn't, it should be a level playing field. If you've got a small cake, you need an accessory apartment and you have an acre property, why shouldn't they be able to add on an accessory apartment? Sorry. When we talked about accessory apartments, we originally had it, I think, at 750 square feet. And right. you no, and suggested it be 1,000 square feet. I want it to be 1,200. Oh, okay. No, 1,000 works. It doesn't work as well. But it's 1,000. It's fine for a handicapped person. It was 750 net. 
So a thousand gross is about something. I'm not counterdicting that at all. All okay. I'm saying is that it's not a level playing field for right. all the homeowners. That get and I find that frustrating. But a larger, a larger house has the ability to take a larger, a new larger mass and sort of blend it back in, right? right? So, you know, an 800 square foot cape with a thousand square foot stair added to it. Yeah, obvious. would be too much. Yeah. Right. Right. So, no, and I'm not so that's why I think we had the percentage. I'd be okay with, say, adding language that said something like 10% uh, of the existing, 10% of the dwelling, not including the area required for, you know, era stairs or some something like that. Some language that talked about some functional piece, because that's probably always the same square footage. It's about 300 square feet. So what is this 10% supposed to be for? It's just supposed to limit these things to not become oversized. This is for about modest, affordable, not affordable, but a modest, reasonable housing stock and not okay. just the ability to... Well, the discussion, the discussion started out of, well, it should just be conversion. You're just allowed to convert. And then the discussion was, well, is that really, you, when you convert, you're going to have to do something. Probably put a kitchen in or something along those lines. N maybe not even, the, yeah. Yeah, does it, so does that mean that you're you're bumping out, you know, one wall by, you know, two feet, putting a, I don't know, you know, a, a little alcove out? Um, yeah, a, a mud room off the bat. I, I don't know, there's something, and that's really where that came from was not it the ten percent is for something but right when you when you're converting there's I wouldn't want to say yeah you can convert from single to two family but with that conversion you're not allowed to make any changes to the structure at all. Nancy, have you worked on so in terms of these numbers though with that yeah. nine hundred that yeah. qualify for this? I'm just yeah. curious. Okay. You know, I'm thinking about my little seventeen hundred square foot house and like there's not eight rooms. Like that right. it, where eight rooms gets right. you to a kind of a minimum <coughs> square footage, which I think is bigger than what we're all thinking about here. Isn't that correct? I mean Eight, eight habitable rooms. Eight habitable eight rooms. Bathrooms and kitchens. If you built a house in 42 with eight rooms, it's probably a big house. Yeah, eight that's why. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Principal yeah, rooms. Like so have you, have you done any conversions under this? No. no. There was 100 square foot. Yeah. Where, um, we, we attempted, but we couldn't get the stair because the lot was too tight. So it didn't work out for them. They wanted to. They had the, they, they met the bylaw, but in order to be able to accommodate making it into two, two families, we needed to find a way to get an exit stair from the second floor. But they were hampered because the lot's so small right. that the bylaws didn't allow us to put on any addition anywhere in order Good. to be able to do That's it. Good. That's okay. Yeah, I, and I, I, just, I, that I was can be sympathetic answer. to the family, but I'm just saying there are some lots right. that you just can't do stuff to. That's right. And there are natural limits based upon our But not everywhere. Bylaws. That's like one place. Can you, could you, the example that was coming up before the building inspector, right, was that somebody took a home, doubled its size essentially, and then went for this. Isn't that what would have happened? Or oh, how there were happen? a ton of different things. So many different approaches. Um, but the point is they had eight rooms to begin with. Yeah. But then they expanded it, and then they went for their two families. But it wouldn't matter. Because but now you're converting a single family rooms. home to a two family home. In a single family neighborhood, and you're putting two families in it. I mean, I would, I would want my neighbors to have a two-family either, and they wouldn't because the houses are too, too, too young. I mean, too old. Too young. <laughs> too young. Too um, young. So all I'm saying, and you know, you obviously you guys do what you want to do, I just think that we, we try to limit things in a way that has consequences and is necessarily, it's somewhat arbitrary is what I want to say. I would rather see this bylaw limited in a way that that is equal, all right? So that if, if we're talking, and, and I again, I don't know what the 10% means, so I'm, I'm hearing stare or... Anything that contributes to gross floor area currently, as gross floor area is defined, so is what could, it means. So they could never add a family room and then ask for a conversion, because that family room, then they would keep them from doing it. If they got them saying? to eight, then... 
they would well, fall no, for no, yeah. 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 So what's wrong with the house that was the example where they had added on all this space and now they want to make it into a two-family? It's not that that was the one problem. It's that we had a lot of different developers coming in with different ideas of how to basically get around the footnote and what we thought was the intent of the footnote. Um, and it became it so we couldn't say like what the intent is right because it wasn't written in the bylaw but we were it felt like we were telling different things to different people and it got really uncomfortable right. so that's why we wanted to clarify the zoning but I, I guess I'm still so the way I read this and the way I think the billing switcher might interpret this is that the conversion does not increase the gross value by more than 10% right. which to me would mean that the original house could f be expanded for that unit and so then the conversion to two family is limited to 10%. See, even that's going to be, yeah, I don't that's going to be, like, I see what you're saying, I hear yeah, what you're saying, see. but I can also see the other side of that. Like, how do we limit what <coughs> is part yeah. of the conversion? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I understand that the conversion happens and then there's later and additions later and future owners and whatever, but at the time of the conversion, how do we say, well, that's not really needed for the conversion and, and this is. I mean, there are, yes, there are certain things from a, the code, a code standpoint that would be very easy to attribute to a conversion. To egresses. But this is starting to feel like it's going to be another challenge at the counter. Well, <clears throat> I'm trying to simplify the, it. The goal of the whole thing was to preserve the big old houses and the appearance of the big old houses in their existing neighborhoods. Now, if anything more than 10% ballooning is going to just to avoid that goal. I mean, we could, what we could do is we could put, like obviously, if someone wants to go above and beyond the 10%, they can get a variance right. for it. Right. Or we could build in a waiver, like a nut. <coughs> or they could waiver. The we build in a waiver that, that would be negotiated at the zoning board. Yeah, that's what I was gonna ask what we could do. You know, I mean, so it's not the thresholds of a variance, but it's not just a buy right, or a, not a buy right. You know, they can you know what I'm saying. Fight their way through the historical commission, tear the whole thing down, and start over. I mean, but they couldn't build it. They couldn't build a two family. No, yeah. once they tear it down, <laughs> they put it down under a place. Yeah, right. I get. Uh, yeah. you know, do you see what I'm saying? Is that yeah, yeah. I, th I, th I think it's still arbitrary. So if the goal is to limit expansion, then. I mean, if you have to limit, I don't want you to, but an architect, I would. But you have to say it can never be added on more than 10% over the lifetime of the two family. I mean, that's what I'm hearing from you, or whatever that number may be. But if the goal is to keep it small and what it is, then no additions can be made to it. And I don't know that you can do that. The problem is all zoning is relatively arbitrary. Sure. The fact that I have a, I live in a S15 and a right, my neighbor is in an S20, yeah. arbitrary. Yeah, it is arbitrary. But so. I think as a somebody who has to interpret these for owners who come to me for mm -hmm. advice, how do I advise them on this? I don't know how to advise them on the 10%. You can add a stair on. You add 10% to the huge, foot. <laughs> but let's add these family rooms and make a grade room for both units, but we can only add 10% for a stair. That's no, no, it's ten, it's ten, right now it's 10% of anything. So you take your 2,000 square feet, you've got 200 square feet to do whatever you want. It could be a kitchen, it could be stair. Right, whatever. But I can also add a family room because both owners want to add a family room. To, uh, that's as long as it's Not if it goes not over 10%. Not if you exceeded the 10% already. But it has nothing to do with converting it. Well, that's, see, this is where I already have yeah. in this conversation yeah. that yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. yeah. I, I, the, the way that, that, the way that it is written at the moment, the future is happening right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, uh, it does. I mean, it, it, the two the two pieces that we're debating. One is that at the time, in 1942, had eight rooms. So the example that you brought up could certainly happen. You could expand it as long as your initial 1942 had eight rooms, and you still qualify for this piece. And then, in addition, the conversion at on the date of application for conversion so in the moment in time that you submit for the conversion you can't ask for 10% more but the next day Until January 1st 
They're missing the January 1st piece, whichever is earlier. So she could do it in an addition right now. Right. And then in January 2nd, come in and do a conversion. You got it. But the time is getting shorter and shorter to add on before converting. Yeah, but yeah, what but could they add on after? After, yeah, after but they I'm saying after, 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 after you convert. The way you were explaining it sounded yeah. like you were talking no, about No, I'm saying, before. I'm saying, so before, yes, yeah, so that's fine. If I don't read that in here. So is that true? I mean, that you're not allowed to have expand it before? Because I don't see that in here. It says that you can't increase the gross floor area of the structure by more than 10% of the dwelling existing on the date of application for the conversion or on January 1st, 2020, whichever is earlier. So January 1st, 2020 is gonna be frozen in time. For All these properties are gonna be frozen in time on that date. So they can't add anything more than that 10%? No, as if part they, of the No, 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 as no they can't as part of their conversion. That's the 10%. Okay, all right, all right. So, right. Back to so you can't you can't do the example you cannot expand 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 then go in for your conversion like we'll we, that we would look at the building records from January first twenty twenty until whatever approach. date and we would see like have you already exceeded this but what you could do is you could if your building and this is I think the point of it is if your building met the code right was was uh, eight it was yeah. Um, before 1942 and eight, and, and eight rooms, right? right. Uh, you could convert it if it met that, and you wind up with these two little small things, you know, two little small units, um, and then uh, next year, come and put um, two family rooms on. Right. Yes, yes, you could. Yeah. Of the way but, this reads right but now, the, yes. E, but, and, and I guess, I'm okay with that because there's a there's probably right we're talking about Reading here with small lots and you know the chances are you're not ever going to you, you, yeah, you may not right you not may, may not I think the, the 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 bigger issue is can you meet can you actually convert to livable permittable spaces given the footprint of the building as of January 1st you know uh, that was in existence in 1942 and given the footprint that it is as of uh, January 1st right that's a so we didn't solve it. So what do you want to do? No, we, we never solve anything in zoning. We just create more unintended consequences. <laughs> May I make a suggestion? Change the first conversion to, um, so it says that, may be converted into a two-family dwelling provided that the resulting structure, structure is not, does not have an increase in the gross floor area by more than 10%. Which means that if you want to go back afterwards and increase the area by more than 10%, well, you got to convert it back to a one family because you can't meet the two family anymore. That's a pretzel. I don't know about that. So once you convert it, you can never be 10% bigger than it was on January 1st. 2020, correct. 2020. And if you want to make it bigger, put it back as a one family. It's essentially what the what the intent was correct that still comes back to the 10 percent is pretty random it is pretty random yeah um could it be 12 percent could it be could it be a square footage um yeah that's right yeah or it could be both like with accessory apartments I was say, well, I can't a thousand square feet and not more than a third or whatever right. whichever is greater yes. Less. No, I think a thousand is the most you can have. A thousand is the most, but you no. have to go by what's most. less. It, a third, it's a third of the gross square footage of the original yeah. house. Right. Or no more than a thousand. Right. So right. whatever the okay. lesser okay. of the Of the uh, including uh, finished <coughs> basements and stuff. Yeah. You can but not garages. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So they start hanging paneling up in their basement. They call it finished, and they count that in there. And the garages are tricky too because with these with some of these two family conversions we were seeing like the three three or four car garage and right. it's like well it doesn't look like a single family right. the, you know it's just yeah I don't know. it's a tricky I, I would tell you right off it's really a tricky given well, the fact that you have the accessory apartment bylaw I don't even know whether you need this in order to tell you the truth but 
Well, this applies to like uh, a different. It's in the. It's already in the Bible. It's already. Yeah, yeah, I know. It'd be hard right. to get rid of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I and that's re and I get. That's really the point here. Is it's in there. We don't necessarily want to get rid of it because yeah. it it applies to someone. Um, it does. It applies it, to quite a few. And um, um, but we also don't want it to be used as a tool for people to get around the intent. And that's really where we're at. Yeah. It's is, only uh, right. We'd honestly. What's We'd rather <laughs> rather get rid of it. I mean, yeah. town council told us to get rid of it. Yeah. Many times. Many times. Yeah. Many many times. Um, so what? You mean just delete the button, the, the footnote? Yeah. Or just not and just have don't even thing. allow <clears throat> conversion. He's, he's thinks this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Right. Those were his words. So, well, we so if find, we make we it more clear, more predictable, <laughs> and put maybe and attach it to a special permit process, then that's a little bit more defensible. What do we do? We then just arbitrarily it? telling different developers what they can and cannot do based on what we think looks like a single family home. It's tricky. So what are you suggesting? That everything after the Zoning Board of Appeals is deleted? We need, I have no problem with the 10%. You call it arbitrary, but 1942 and eight rooms is arbitrary. Right. <laughs> but I'm okay with that. I don't know what 10% means. It's 10%. It's 2,000 well, square feet. You define it better than a lot of people. You've got to figure it out. That's <laughs> why well, they pay you. And they're <laughs> yeah, exactly. So or give you know. us a number that you think would be. I, I don't know the number. I'm not done yeah. anything that, that well, would tell right. me. Right. And that's, that's, that's why we can't do it. Because isn't the number's different for every every, every single, single house. house. Yeah. And every single so, But that's why it was a percentage. Too. Right. Yeah. So what's the downside of just removing the footnote? We had this conversation before. The historical. If somebody had a converted two-family, they can now tear it down, and they've got a two-family to go forward. If, if they have a two-family... Mm, no, I don't know that that's not correct. I think we have to be very correct. careful how we talk about this, because there's a lot of nuance. Yeah. 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 The way the building official views this, mm -hmm. because I just dealt with this, is that if the home is converted to a two-family based upon this bylaw, it, if it's torn down, it loses its two-family status. And I agree 100% with you. Yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's how yeah. it's yeah. But my problem is, in 10 years, when we've replaced the building inspector, who's never seen this bylaw, should be it, it should be, but you know it's going to miss, and they're going to go, okay, it's a two-family right now. I guess you can tear it down and build another two-family. So when you, no, you're right, when you get, when you get rid of it right now. So let me ask this well, question. Well, it's not yes. right now, but it could be. Oh, I'm sorry. We've added it. The way we've written it right <laughs> yeah. now, we've added it. We've added a special permit. Yeah. If we delete, let me see, maybe convert it into a two-family dwelling, provided that the external appearance a single family home is retained. Essentially, the, we're deleting the second blue sentence, right? The second edition. Does it accomplish the same thing? If we delete this second. Uh, conversion does not increase the gross floor area. Provided that the conversion does not. So take away that whole thing. Whatever. Provided that the external appearance of existing single family is retained. That's the. So basically, everything. It's in front of. It's in front of ZBA so for a special ZBA. permit. Right. And uh, they'll the, have to And their direction is that it has to look like a two family yeah, dwelling. Yeah, but I, I mean, well, I yeah. It look like a single family. Single family. Oh, sorry, single right. family dwelling. So then they're going to have this conversation with, with no parameters. Could you do like, like before? Like some before we were having it at the staff level. Right. Right. So I don't know. I mean, I feel like the intent could. Well, Do we want to have language that really gets to what the what we think the intent of this bylaw was? Well, the intent well, was to limit how much you expanded right. it and yeah. that you kept it as a single family. I mean, the, f the first two criteria are established, 42 and 8 rooms, and the bottom of it, maintaining the single family dwelling look. So all we really added was that there's a limit to the increase in square footage. And that it goes to the zoning board. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, as long as it goes to the ZBA. I don't think it's uh, losing the 10 percent is a problem. It's the thing but is the, that we're then sticking them with a very, we're, we're putting them in a position I, of making potentially my arbitrary point was just decisions. To, Which they already do. That's their mission in life. <laughs> well, <laughs> there are at least a few parameters for other special permits. And that was my and point. And if you take that out and, and it goes there, how do you limit 
Right. We might end up with the same thing we're getting today. It's just that there'll be a special permit right. attached to They'll it. They'll just say you and meet so, this criteria. So and what can. they feel looks like a single family home may not be what you guys feel looks like a single family mm -hmm. home, or it may which is fine because mm -hmm. there's a pu there's a neighborhood public so input they, process so, okay. associated okay. with that. Okay. So that's good, right? I mean, that's really what you want, right? That's the process that should happen. And right, I agree. Yeah, they didn't take the neighbor's input in the last but one that I went to. <laughs> right. I still think we should have a limit. And you could exclude, you know, code required portions, or you could just increase that 10% to something. So you do want a limit or you don't? I, I don't have a problem with the way it's written. Except that you're telling me it sounds like it may be misinterpreted. Well, just the con just because we were talking about what does conversion actually yeah, what does that like mean? like should we say conversion for meeting code purposes? No, you're changing it to a two family. Yeah. You're going to need a second kitchen, and you may need an additional bathroom, really small house. But those are code. Those those would be code requirements for creating a second unit, right? So there are conversions like for making the house bigger, having a family room, and then there are conversions like an egress or a bathroom. No, I would or say kitchen. I would be specific about the egress requirements. That's the only thing I would exclude. Everything else is part of the what you've been handed, and you have to figure out a way to make that plan work. Right? They're not all going to be four bedroom. They're not going to be two four bedroom apartments. It's likely you're going to have to take one of the rooms and make it into the kitchen, some sort of maybe open kitchen, and you get maybe two bedrooms out of that. And maybe it's only a single bathroom or a bath and a half. They're not going to be four bedroom, two bath townhouses. That's a whole different mechanism. That wasn't the intent of this at right. all. But this if you don't small. have a limit, that's what you'll end up with. Yeah, there's nothing in here other than your saying 10% of the drawing. There's nothing to say that you can't add on three more bedrooms down the road. Yeah. There's nothing in here that allows, that says that. If it still looks like a single family house, what's, what's the difference? Our existing well, parameters will limit that, mm -hmm. the 25% lot well, coverage. That's, well, yeah, that's what I'm on saying. On the smaller the lots. The 25% yeah. on a small lot, they may not even be able to convert it. Right. Because they can't get the stair to work. So I think we have, uh, right, there's, I, I've heard three or maybe four different ways to go with this. We could um, go with, I'm going to call it Tony's way, of um, re sort of flipping this so that, um, so that the 10% applies after conversion. Always. Always. Forever. Um, we could get rid of the 10% and just put the note in there um, about um, special part of that. Thing. Yeah, about um, areas required, areas for, egress. required for egress. And don't have, just leave it, leave it that way. Um, we could keep the 10% and include that egress note. Or the fourth suggestion was um, to cut it, go to all the way back, um, and just really punt it to the um, BZ, uh, to the ZBA with a special permit process. Because I don't, I don't think we can get rid of it. Um, I'm, I guess I'll say I'm not in favor of putting a specific square foot number on there because I think that becomes as arbitrary, arbitrary as using a 10%. Um, yeah. um, so those are the, I think the four, uh, four things that I've heard. Um, thoughts? I like my idea. <laughs> I like Tony's idea. Because I think that gets, in the end, that gets to the to oh, what was intended. Plan. Yeah. Which one was that? <laughs> you have it. You have it fully written down, right? I'm mostly written down. Yeah. The conver the conversion, the resulting structure, is not more than a gross floor area of 10 percent more than as of the date. So instead of conversion, it's the resulting structure. Resulting structure. Okay. Can you say that, Tony? Again? All right. Sorry. Family dwelling provided that the resulting structure does not have an increase to the gross floor area of the by, of more than 10 percent of the dwelling existing on the date of the application for conversion or January 1st, 2020, whichever is earlier. Right. 
I wonder if we should say never. Yeah, get never. Because resulting, I feel like, could be, like, is resulting, okay. like, when that first C of O is issued, yeah. and then, like, a future. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Resulting from the conversion could be different then. Yes, you're right. Yeah. Okay. There is never an increase to the gross floor area of more than 10%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never kind of like phrase into that one. It never does it belong. As long as it exists, that's what you can. Well, I could. If you give me your wording, I could try to figure out how to add more right. into it. Or, uh, but then it would have to be, you'd have to be talking about, are we talking about the resulting structure as a whole or each unit? The, res the resulting structure as a whole. Yeah. yeah. So then it's like, okay, if, if you have a home, and you're, you can make an easy conversion, you don't have to add anything. Mm -hmm. And then one person buys one side and another person buys the other side and that one person puts on like a big addition and the other person never can do anything. Like, a, you know what I mean? Yep. Yep. One owner yep. could take up that 10%. No, we're not talking, do we care? No, we don't care. I'm just playing this yeah. out. We don't care. We don't care. Yeah. Okay. Then they can argue with the condo association. Yeah. 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 There was your question. Yeah. Part one. Well, what she said, what, when one person can do it, one section can do it, other can't, you're now talking about a condo situation. Yeah. And that's what happens. Not a two family. There's a difference. The two families always get converted to condos. That's why they do it. Yeah. You can own both units in a condo. Yeah. But usually they condoize it so that they do have that option of selling off one of the units. Yeah. That's probably more than I think. I double the So can we, do we have time, not tonight, do we have time in the schedule that you can, because I don't think we're going to wordsmith at 10 o'clock at night no, effectively, no, no, no. Yeah. Could, that, that you can word, wordsmith yeah. this, I think, and please speak off if, if anyone has um, uh, feels something different. But the idea here is that the resulting structure would be no more than 10% as of this date um, uh, um, uh, if it wants to continue as a two-family use. And however that gets worded so that it's coherent, <laughs> I think that's... Yeah. Be tough, that but. meets what we yeah. were trying to do. Okay. And no, no, that's all good because right through the conversation, we we found more holes. Yeah. No, it's good. Thank you for yeah. giving it. Just <laughs> um, and yes, ten percent is arbitrary, <laughs> but um, and so would twenty percent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, and I'm not. I, I don't care about the ten percent. Yeah. It wasn't clear what that meant. Yeah. And how do you, as a building official, figure out, or as an architect, figure out, okay, this counts as 10%, but I want to also add three bedrooms and a main bedroom. So that when does that, yeah. yeah. I already have one bedroom. Right. It's part of it. So this will actually limit that. Limit and that. that's the intent of the yeah. bylaw. Then let it be the intent of the bylaw. And then I go to owners and say, look, this is what you can do, but yeah, as of January 1st, your building was this big, you know, 2,000 right. square feet. You've and I make them think twice about making it into a condo. So tell your clients they have six months to get your applications <laughs> going. Yeah, oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, why don't we, con should we continue this conversation? Two. Um, July 8th is really... The, unless you want to add another meeting for zoning. No, I think, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to need it for meeting minutes. Um. <laughs> well, you do still have mixed use. We do. Yeah. yeah. I don't have any comments. So. Okay. <laughs> we expected you to fix that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can cool. we table this until we figure out where we are? Continue to July 8th, but that would probably be the last. Yeah, like so, the, go. we're going to have to give everything to town council in August for the 
to review for the warrant, which will close in September. So, well, no, I was thinking. Okay. Can we? We're, we're just. Oh, put, no, one. Put it to the side. Yeah. We'll see how we do with um, with mm -hmm. mixed use, okay. and if we can dispatch that tonight, then we'll fit. We'll we'll fit footnote one into into that next meeting. If we have to deal with both of them, then I think that we need another meeting. Need another meeting. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Which was the original plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can we have two public hearings going on at the same time? That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's you Yeah. Notice is hereby given that under MGL Chapter 40A, Section 5, the Running Community Planning and Development Commission, CBDC, to hold a public hearing in the Select Board's meeting room at Reading Town Hall, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Mass, on Monday, June 10th, 2019, at 9.15 p.m., to consider the following proposed zoning bylaw amendments in advance of the November 2019 subsequent town meeting. To allow mixed-use projects by special permit from the CPDC and the Business A and the Business C districts in Table 5.3.1, Table of Uses for Business and Industrial Districts, by including a definition of mixed-use in Section 2.0 Definitions, by the insertion of 5.6.8 mixed-use regulations with all subsequent sections of 5.6.8 numbered accordingly, and by amending section 6.0 intensity regulations to account for the mixed use projects. Complete drafts of the proposed amendments are available to the public in the Public Services Department on Town Hall on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and on Tuesday from 7.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. and on the town website the Thursday prior to the hearing date. Thank you. So I, you guys made some good progress the last few months, and I just added some comments. I didn't want to like undo anything that you guys had arrived at while I was at away. Um, but so, so I just added some comments on the side um, after I reviewed it. I don't know if you had a chance to look at them before right now or what, but. Um, so in your review, did you have any um, Anything that stuck out? Yes. Yes. So if you look under definitions, um, I put two comments. That <clears throat> you broadened the definition of mixed use, which I think is going to have a lot of unintended consequences. Unless it's your intention. Which part of it makes it broad? So um, the very the top definition is what you guys had done, and I um, didn't change it. Two or more permitted principal categories listed. In the table of uses, the uses must be permitted by right or by special permit within the zoning district in which the structure or project lies. So that if you, that's how you define it, and then in the table, you always require a special permit. That means, for example, that in the linear properties building down the street where um, the natural food store is, you couldn't have, I believe there is a Tutoring, tutoring facility going in, which would be under the institutional use category, as well as business uses. So that a building that already exists that's going to have multiple different uses from different use categories would have to come to you for a special permit. And right now that's not the case. Right now they can just do a tenant fit out. And as long as they have parking and you know, aren't changing the exterior of the building or the site, they can go in that space. Well, uh, um, this is somewhat related, but but entirely. Um, <clears throat> um, but here's a question for that. 
So if, um, if the linear properties, right, they are permitted for, um, for retail use, right? Um, in the category that is business and service uses. And so if they have an institutional use that's going in there, they're not permitted for that. And so they should be coming to us. Well, whether they go through a special permit process or uh, um, or not, they 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 should be coming to us. And, and uh, this actually came up between Andrew and I when we were talking about um, all, all the conversions of retail uses mm -hmm. to office. Um, to office use, and they can do that. Um, they can do that by right because they're changing in these categories and and I think that our categories we had a long discussion while you were gone yeah. uh, about categories I'm sorry I brought that up no, but yeah. but I think that our categories have changed over um, over time right uh, not maybe not the actual categories but all the uses in the categories I don't think when we added all the different uses and stuff we were all that focused on on the categories mm -hmm. and so what that means the result there is that that someone can easily change from uh, retail use to a doctor's office use and you know what they don't come and we don't they don't come to us they don't come to anyone they make that change and that is what it is, even though it does have ramifications on how that building operates. And we we would have done something different. So I, I, I'm going back to this whole idea of, of categories and when uses change, buildings change categories, they should, should be reviewed. Right, so, but I also think that that's sort of like right style. now, like those two examples I gave you are yeah. uses that are permitted by right in business A. So like they're by right in business A, but the mere fact that it would fall under it would it could be viewed as a mixed use building, the way mixed use is defined. No, but there's no residential component. Well, That's my definition. Right. Your definition is the top one. Where you took that piece out. Right. Can you point this your note out here, which is what I think you clarified it. So, Julie's note at the bottom, any lot or structure within a business or industrial district may contain multiple principal and accessory uses insofar as each use is permitted either by right or by special permit in that district. If one of the uses is a residential use, then the mixed use regulation shall apply. I mean, unless you, to John's point, like really do want to talk to every business owner that's going into a building with uses that are in other categories. I don't I, well, or do we need to look at the categories? I think we need to look at the uses, categories, like, which is a, which sort yeah. of a different discussion. Yeah. But I do think we need to look at the, the categories because when people change cat use categories, they generally, they're changing the function of the use of that. And I know that this board would look at um, a development that has a bank very different than a Dunkin' Donuts. And right now, they fall under the same category, I think. Right, no, you're but, right, they do. You know. Um, um, but, like, can, do you remember a time? Maybe not a bank, John but, and, uh, an and office. Dave. Yeah. Why, because we're Do you old? remember a time? No, because you've been on the board a long time. When the use table was different looking and like it wasn't parsed up this way? I remember it was on yeah. parchment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Yes, I, I, I do think if you go back, um, the the number of uses were not we didn't have so many uses and I think that we collapsed some of the categories recently. Recently meaning in the okay. past five years. Yeah, so if they were collapsed then this is how, partly why we would end up with this right. non oversight. Right. Right. Or whatever. You that being said, I'm the ones that I'm highlighting. I think we're all in this category, but we've ne we never. I think when we were looking at this, we never had that sort of conversation and that realization about what the categories really, how they function, and what it means to have them in different categories. Right. To, to I think the discussion before was it's a nice header. <laughs> And I'll make it bold. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but it really do. They yeah. they have yeah. a function and right. a regulatory purpose. No, I I know. 
Um, so any new development or development that changes the exterior of the building a certain amount or the parking would come to you anyway as part of a, special, a site plan review. Yeah, so like what I'm really getting at is like the existing buildings that we have on South Main Street where the yeah. business site primarily is. Like, do we need to add another level of oversight whereby like every different mixed use? No, um, no. The Dollar Tree didn't come before us, right? I think that's business. That's Walgreens. Yeah. Business B, and they just moved in. So it's They're tail potentially going to make changes to their storefront site plan if review. It, then they would. They played kind of like they didn't know what we were talking about. Maybe but they, they can't ever sign. Right, I think they're just doing a tenant fit out. There's no change of use or changes to the exterior of the building or parking lot. Well, they're not acknowledging any changes to the exterior. Right. Which? To the storefronts. But there's obviously something written into that site plan that directed Walgreens to do something with those windows, right? How they could be used, what was in them. But and well, I'm right. sorry. But that <laughs> like so sorry. We wouldn't want the windows to be blocked by anyone that goes in there. So we but I'd have to see if it's actually like written down. I am pretty sure it probably is. Yeah. Because that was a big deal. Um so but going back to your let's not let's stay on the mixed use thing. Um because I think your question was even separate. The question you write raise here is do we really want to have anyone like a tutoring center when they're going to a retail, they're in two different categories, have them have to get a special permit? And I would say, no, I don't think that's really where we were, where we're headed. Um, and I think the reason why we took the, the residential component out is, um, is um, if there was a retail with office above, um, for well, that would still be in the same category. Well, you can have uh, a thing with depends. Yeah, I guess here, right? It, it depends, but probably it would be. Yeah, we had a thing years ago with the coupon on the second floor of the yeah, the right? Bank, the district persons. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've forgotten how we handled that, but I mean, it's something that did come up. Yeah. I've also <laughs> I, I, given the perfect world, the uh, drive-through window would be a separate use category that we could prohibit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't, I guess, um, uh, but adding the resident, defining it as just um, something with a residential component, to me, is fine. Well, cause like, just to so that we don't get right now. Actually, in the bylaw, there's nothing that prohibits multiple principal uses in the same building, and we do allow multifamily and retail in business A. So right now, there people could take a property down on South Main Street and create a mixed use, and if they didn't, if they had enough parking already. And they didn't really change the building much, and they, it was all interior. This board would never know about it. So, what the reason that I suggested we have mixed use as a category is not only to define it and make it obvious that it's something that currently you could do if you read the bylaw closely enough, but also to have regulations around it and a process that it would come to the board. So, that's why I had put a residential. Yeah. I defined it that way originally. Um, but if your long-term goal is to separate office and retail into different uses, would you still want to review that in the future if you did separate those use categories? Well, yeah, yes, but not necessarily require a special permit. Right. right. There's a difference, right? Yeah. There, the, when you change the use, you you are supposed to come for site plan review. Only if you also change parking in the building. No, you just change of use triggers site plan. Does it? I believe My so. Minus remembering. <coughs> is it possible to 
accepts your definition of mixed-use. Existing uh, institutional commercial or but multi Leave out the issue, one of so. which is a residential okay. use. Basically, the, the mixed use is, by definition, the combination of two or more permitted principal uses from different categories. And then in the table, you have uh, a note. You know, we need to define that in the de yeah. definition up there and, and expressly say mixed use does not generally include residential. No, but I'm saying that it should be able to include residential, but has different set of requirements. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you can say residential mixed use. Sorry, Dave, what did you say? It's my typical crazy ideas of um, why do we want to exclude the residential piece from the mixed use? Or why would it, why would it always have a residential? Um, do we want a definition of mixed use that includes uh, non-residential? Entirely. Yeah, you guys are asking the same thing in just yes. in different ways. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, we went, uh, uh, honestly, we went through 75% of this with the residential, and then at the last discussion, we said, you know, we should have, we, we shouldn't restrict it to residential, to a, right, a multi-use yeah, building yeah. that has residential. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, um, to some degree, I think that's a different discussion. I think you can probably do that anyways. Do what anyway? Have a building with with multiple, with uses in multiple categories. We do. Oh, you can. Yes, yeah. you absolutely So can. we don't necessarily need any yeah. specific. Like if you just look through what's permitted in business A. Yeah. That's what you can do, because we don't say anywhere that you can't. But we, we don't expressly permit it either. Yeah. So I'm for going back and adding the residential use in the definition. I think, as Julie points out, not having it in there probably causes more problems than what the original <laughs> intent of this whole discussion was. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm just thinking we got stuck on the definition again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> know what it is <laughs> but that's the most imp I think that then Im um, informs the rest and I, I liked how you guys decided to um, the changes that we had made to multifamily you just did away with because we don't want to we, we don't want the entire corridor for multifamily um, let's see Okay, so <coughs> the Okay, and then under so the mixed use provisions on um, the third page where there's the table, there was um, a comment that I had when I was looking through this. Um, where we say mixed use and like where it's allowed and where it's not allowed. In business B, we say no, and that is like technically, I guess, correct. However, I wonder if it wouldn't be worth putting a footnote and like referring people to downtown smart growth district. Because no, I get that, but I think that adding footnotes then creates, I know, I know, I know, I know. creates more It just it complexity. feels like we're saying, no, you can't I do mixed use downtown, and that's not true. It's not business fee downtown. But it's not business fee. It is business fee downtown. It's downtown smart growth district over it. What? Yeah, it's an overlay so we're like, talking about. I mean, it's yeah. not yeah. technically business fee, but it is, but 
but under business B, yeah. you can't. And I think we yeah. don't try and I think that they should just come talk to staff. Well, I mean, it says residential uses and business B says no. Right, that's why we There's say no. no. Yes. That's why we say yeah. no here. But then, like, I'm looking at it and it feels discouraging. This is people's jobs. I mean, yeah. they're supposed to. You'd be surprised. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if they did talk to us, we would talk. Yeah, them. right. Um, okay. So, never mind. <sighs> okay. And then. And then there's the specific re regulations. Do you think the biggest comment was on parking? To yeah. Maximum? Sorry, I need to step out for a minute. <coughs> um. Nick, you had a comment about under 568. Um, that is a good comment. <coughs> yeah, it's something that happened in Tinkero where they, they had a really poorly written mixed use and the developer figured it out. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you just built a bunch of apartments and stuck a little convenience store in the middle of it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much told them all to go screw. Where in uh, I couldn't tell you where exactly, but I can picture a few. I know somebody on the planning board, so it's that they're like one of those poor Yeah, I mean, that's the town my husband grew up in. Yeah, well, he got out. Um, but like this, <clears throat> this could, this could result in that the way that this is written. I mean, the lots on South Main Street are small and shallow, so I think it's probably unlikely. Okay. Um, if someone <coughs> compiled a lot of parcels. Um, the proposed 5685 loading, does this by definition include loading and delivery? What are you asking? Sorry. 5685 is titled loading. Is that loading and delivery or are they already? No, that's, that's loading for delivery or it's loading it all depends which way you're loading <laughs> you're loading the building or you're loading are the you truck are you being delivered or are you <laughs> delivering i don't know yeah <laughs> why dave it's here well i i mean i can imagine the uh, deliveries <laughs> overwhelming the loading spaces um, or ignoring them. I think well, that's we commonly referred to as the same thing. I think that's loading. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean we could say like loading and deliveries and we can say loading and deliveries shall not be staged for, on Main Street. Um, well, it's like the last item which is the Proposed commercial spaces are limited for lease to tenants that do not require deliveries. Yeah, but even offices get deliveries. Wait, hold on. I'm confused. Why did I write that? Five, six, eight, five. C2. Yeah, I know. I'm confused about it. I'm just trying to figure out what I meant by that. Which means that it's not good zoning. <laughs> <laughs> I do remind myself what it means. Um. Oh, 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 I see. Unless any of the following criteria are met. Right. I just don't know. I don't really use that. Yeah. I don't know. That might be. Yeah. That might be stupid. But maybe like 
times are changing. <laughs> Maybe yeah, it's, drone it's, it's delivery it's a, by drone. It's a, it's think it's about a, what you want and like it's there. That pulls up That's fine, but the drone can't <laughs> land on Main Street. <laughs> 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 or buy a 3D printer. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know why we're getting caught up in that. I think it's understood what loading means. We were getting caught up on C2, I think. Yeah. Um, I'm getting caught up on A and B because I don't know why you need both. I said the same thing. <laughs> like, you, you can't load from anywhere that's not on your property, is what it says in A, basically. And then B says you have to contain loading on your property. Well, the first one is because right now it's a bagel <coughs> shop of effect where they'll just have a truck idling on a side street until they open. Or they'll think they can do that. Or okay, they'll just stop on Main Street. Or they'll stop on Main <laughs> yeah, Street. Yeah, okay, because it's the word stage, right? And you can board that if you want, but I kind of glossed over the first five, six, eight, by the way. Yeah, I know. So what if we got rid of, um, where it says, or separated into different structures instead of getting rid of <coughs> if more than one principle is permitted on the lot. And just say, uh, or separated into different structures if approved by the special permit granting authority. Right. So right. if it were permitted, we it's in there somewhere. Yeah. But then we could see what they were proposing. Maybe it's two buildings and one's all residential or all one use, and the other one has a commercial piece in it and something else, you know, above it. It's not just like a standalone. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's well done enough where it works. Maybe yeah. somebody comes up with a way to do that. So it doesn't look like right. you know, something horrible because the sites are so hard to accommodate. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would recommend there, something like that. And of course, you could always keep the is permitted if it's if you want to specify that it has to be permitted before we even would approve. <coughs> keep something like that in there too. Well, if more than one principal building is permitted on the lot, we've already <coughs> said that it is that it would be. We added that in the, the other section. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. right. So that's just redundant. Yeah, exactly. so, yeah. Right, I think just to delete that. Yeah. Right. You don't have to say special permit granting authority. You can say CPDC since it says that there. And then we have these other requirements. Um, dimensional requirements. Um, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just listening. All right. All right. <laughs> Take your time. Please, if you hear us going. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you do hear, to please speak up. Yeah. You, if there's no something more development you want. on South Main Street, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, if you want to volunteer for a board slot, I'm in a board. Good job. There's some talk about the um, commercial component of the mixed use. Mm -hmm. I know that the goal is to keep the corridor primarily commercial, but at a certain point, project viability might be tricky if it's too high of a percentage. That's what we're hearing. Yeah, but you want some feedback on that. We we got the same feedback last week and the, the feedback on from residents in general is no more residential period. So, yeah. If 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 we want like if development needs to have 
if there's if a mixed use development essentially has to have a mixed use. <laughs> Otherwise it's a residential development. I know. Uh, I'm just providing both sides yep. of the story for you guys. I, mm -hmm. I understand. We had a lengthy conversation on that. Mm -hmm. I, think. I know. That's when we added yeah. the yeah. circulation utilities, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think makes it is is accommodating, but makes it trickier to administer. But that's okay. Yes, Oops. I would agree. But it's okay. It is what it is. And it goes back to, to Nancy's mm -hmm. issue is, you know, we can't, we can't pick a number, can't pick a percentage, it's just a function. I mean, so. to, to just keep going on this, like, we're talking right now about rezoning the area for mixed use. If we don't think that this is viable, we shouldn't be having this conversation. We should be having a conversation about rezoning it for residential, which most of the town that aren't developers will lose their mind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's that's where I guess yeah, they come down yeah. to. So, yeah. we are accommodating something by talking about mixed use because, you know, the rezoning South Main Street for all four-story residential is not going to fly. Mm -hmm. I guess that's an overlay, by the way, right? Right. Um, yeah. Or is it, or is it no, just another no, option? No, just just another option. Right. Right. I think netting out these things makes this harder now that I'm reading it again. Why? Because you're, maybe I'm m misunderstanding, but. It seems like in the prior reading, if you didn't net these things out, 25% of the gross floor area could be used for not less than 25% of the total floor area of the structure or structures could be dedicated to commercial space and could include areas for circulation utilities, structure, and building services. We were saying the calculation of 25%. Oh, 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 I get it. Not that okay. the 25% doesn't include that part. Yeah. It's that the 25% nets that out before. So, so we probably want to reword this. Unless I'm the only person in the room that read that that way. We went back and forth with the gross and the net over and over. Yeah, the most, most of the utilities and, and structure is made for, the mechanical room is made for the commercial specifically. Oh, so yeah. it should be part of the uh, calculation of the commercial space. Right. So like that, yeah, we weren't, but we weren't even getting to that point in time. So the, the, the total right. commercial square footage itself doesn't have to, uh, yeah, sorry. It was the calculation. So if the building, to simplify, if the building was 100 square feet, um, then net, sorry, <coughs> yeah, net of the internal structures, then one floor of it would need to be, 25% of that would need to be commercial. So then you said net not include, so do not include the mechanical room and then without including the mechanical room calculated? Yeah, I don't remember It's, it's more so there. the mechanical spaces for the other. For the yeah. other parts, right. yeah. I was just drawing it out because if you, let's say the circulation cores go all four stories or three stories, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. you're, you're doing the same, it doesn't really matter, right? Because it's, right, because it's the it same, yeah. But when you start subtracting mechanical and common area spaces from the upper floors, then you get a smaller number, and that makes the 25% more viable. Right, yeah. Right. When you net them out of the gross yeah. to begin with and then do the math. You're taking floor area out of mm -hmm. the other uses, and right. then you're calculating what the 25% is, and that's what right. has to be commercial. Right. And it doesn't have to be as much. Yep. Wouldn't that so make it harder when you take it out and then make it twenty five percent? It makes it smaller. It makes it smaller. So if your total building was a hundred, you take thirty you know you take a, a, a portion out of that, then your twenty five percent base is less than yeah. the initial. You're probably down to twenty. But that ten percent was calculated as part of the commercial only because mostly that was used for the commercial. For example, like if you take a, a 400 square uh, square foot building, right? Now you're supposed to make 100, 100 uh, square feet as commercial, but out of 100, 20 is used for 
mechanical circulation and things like that, right. I need to use only 80 for the commercial. So it's easier to make 80 commercial. But if you take 20 out from the very beginning, so it's a 400, you make it 380, now I'm required to make it 85 commercial versus 80 commercial. So much math. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Right. So, so uh, now, now required to make it more. Versus 25, less. because in that scenario, 25% of 380 is more, more than, than 400. 25% of 400, which includes 20% 20. 20 20 of the 25. No, wait, yeah, yes. you know what I'm saying. Yep. Which includes 20% that's mechanicals in that scenario. It probably wouldn't be like that all the time, though. There's like a sweet spot, I bet, for the yeah, math. It depends upon where the, what, the, what, what is that used in mechanical normal circulations and things like <coughs> that for. But my, my, my guess is those would be mostly on the first floor. Uh, right. So well, no, no, I guess we're not, we're not saying that the commercial components Commercials, the commercial components, circulation and utilities. I think we were trying to say that the the buildings. <coughs> well, think think of the first floor of the yeah the old market uh, old Atlantic. Okay. I mean, where we've got these, these front to back three or four front to back corridors and and interior yeah. corridors and so forth that would be excluded from. Some, some one of these calculations. I think the intent of this language was to subtract. Was to get the, less of the, the demand. To make the number smaller. Yeah. yeah. To subtract the cores for the upper uses. So that you weren't just grossing out that second, <coughs> third, and fourth floor and saying you need 25% of this when, when you know, whatever's going on up there is less all the stairs and less all the circulation. So we should net out the circulation utilities building services related to the residential component mm -hmm. first yeah, and then do the, the math. That was the intent. The so it's, it's not written correctly, I agree. Yeah, okay. No, it's not written clearly. That, 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 that might work. But it, this is coming to the special permit anyway, so just keeping that as, uh, as your talking point and then you decide what's exactly 25 percent mean during that conversation yeah, but we're not you agree here. On. It's okay <laughs> no, versus defining it here and then making it more uh, okay. uh accurate. <laughs> So you can once. try to leave. I made the mistake once. <laughs> uh, the intent is to make it clear for whomever is. Uh, Plus. Yeah. Plus, just remember when we expanded the downtown smart growth district and I stood up a town meeting and I said to everyone in the room, well, when we put the downtown smart growth district in place in 2009, it's now been eight years and we've only had one project. So don't worry, things don't happen quickly. <laughs> and the very next <laughs> year, we had like four projects. Right. So you could still be around next year when we're looking at all the mixed use projects on Main Street. That would be a good thing, wouldn't that it? That would be a good thing. Yeah. All right, I was trying to like if they ever repave it. Mm -hmm. It would be a good thing. Yeah. into it for utility, so it's just going to be a mess again. <sighs> so once they repave it, I don't want any more development. I want a zip line. Clear <laughs> 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 off the south side and run a zip line. Clear off the east side, sorry, and run a zip line right to downtown. So I'm not fun. repaving it yet because I'm going to get bike lanes, right? That's what's happening. I I yeah, yeah. Trees. It's trees and bike lanes. Trees. I was like, while well, I was away, they decided trees. it's going to be a complete street with a curbside. Curbside. No, curbside. That's why it's not getting paved yet. It's going to take two years, two and a half years to pave the whole thing. They're starting on our end. <coughs> why? I have no idea. So that we have time to build the case for a healthy order. Yeah. All right. I understand the intent is to make commercial drawing less. Yeah. To make it, yeah. To I make it, a, uh, yeah, less. That's the minimum, anyways. Yeah. We're hoping for more, but people are complaining. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not good. We we don't need more residential. We need more commercial. More commercial. Yeah. But when you're making a four-story building, you want to have one floor commercial. Right? Yes. And you, right. And you include some of the things part of the residential, and you say, oh, now it's not enough. You have to go commercial a little bit higher. Right. Which right. then which doesn't is what work. We're trying to right. Avoid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Right, so if it's a four-story building, it doesn't have to be the first entire story to be, to be, to be yeah. To be. That's, that's the same time. Right. Yeah. But in terms of the calculation, if it com does not come out 25%, it comes out 20% on the first floor. Where do I put another 5% on the second floor? So that yeah, that's that's not, that doesn't work. Right. Yeah. yeah, true. Yep. Okay. Should we talk about um, the inclusionary piece of this and then also the parking, which I have? Yep. Issue with. Um, so I didn't. You, I don't know if you talked about the ten percent requirement for affordable at all. I mean, that's like the easiest number to use because that's the number everyone's familiar with, generally speaking. Do you want us to bump it up? Um, no. It's just it, it would. Like, I, I see two ways it could go. One is that we get great projects and we stay on pace with our subsidized housing inventory percentage that we have now over 10. Or we get a lot of nine unit projects. I don't know if that's actually really viable, though. I mean, the, given the lot size. We don't have to approve you know, those. Yeah. True. Or we don't get redevelopment because this makes it too hard. Yeah, no, but we just cannot keep. Ten percent is such a defensible number at town meeting or anywhere. Yeah. When you tell them we're just right. going to get further behind if we're putting residential units and we don't do this, you know, we just get right. in trouble. It is. It's. I think it's the most defensible number yeah. from all angles. I mean, are there other towns that are not doing this? It just seems silly. Oh, there are definitely. What there are towns. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely towns that don't have inclusionary zoning. I mean, and there are towns that do, and they have really... Do these rack up fines? Complex. They've done some... I have a whole spreadsheet. <laughs> they just have more control over their land, if you want to call it that, either because their properties are so expensive. Right? So, so you, the easy example is Nantucket, which has driven itself into a hole at the moment because there's nowhere to, for anyone to live. And so now there's, you know, class war going on on a couple of sites because of the, the lack of... Um, Connecticut, did you see that article yeah. on Connecticut? How there's, all of their zoning is pretty much exclusionary. Every single, <laughs> they don't have, obviously they didn't have the Fort Beacon Fund, yeah. but their legislature has supported it ever since. They would have pushed everything to the edges of the cities and mm -hmm. everything else is excluded. Connecticut. Yep. So some towns do a lot more complicated math. But do they do I mean, do they get dinged? I mean that's what I don't understand. Or no, they're just no, I mean, they fall. It, it depends. They're either way above ten percent that it doesn't really matter. Or they're below it and they're subject to forty B anyway. I mean there's there's all the different options are out there in the three hundred and fifty one municipalities in the state. They're all different. So the, the we act more exclusionary, and then the next Reading Village, or <coughs> whatever the one is that on Eaton, <coughs> we have we we just have to accept it. And so, what's the like? So, what's the calculus? That's my question. Like, is it what is it? Do we <laughs> dislike the the, yep. the the Reading Village and Eaton more? Then, well, I guess wanting to be excluded. I, <laughs> I guess this gives right. This what we're trying to do is um, is encourage development where we want it, and this right. does it. And and hopefully this isn't so onerous that it drives it drives people away. It right, we're walking away. the line. Yeah, we're walking that line. <laughs> right. Um, and if it and if it does, or if, or if the idea here is you just you know build build. Eight units, um, uh, and eight units, and eight units, and we fall behind. Then, yeah, we'd be subject more to, you know, like the there is a development to try and shoot more in a 40B in off a of Duck Road, a while a couple of years back, um, which is like it's no, it's like you know, there's no space in there. That'd be horrible. Um, well, we're, we're running, but we're in no control over it. They could so. do an all commercial, if you will, mixed use or all non-residential. Mixed use, right? That's still a lot. Yeah, that's still a lot. Not getting rid of anything that's not a lot yeah. currently. Yeah. <coughs> True. 
have we, have we so I mean, the t time will tell. Like if right. this is if this not is too viable, much, yeah. or if it's, yeah. But I, I think this okay. is the right number and the yeah. defensible one. So parking. Okay. What was so the before you move on to parking, if I may ask a question about the uh, number three on um, uh, you may be the flexibility for certain dimension requirement for if it is uh, uh, ten percent unit below fifty percent um, median income or the fifteen percent unit. What exactly you guys thinking in terms of giving the flexibility, like decreasing the setbacks even further? Like right now we have zero and uh, ten. Well, like that. that height. is what I meant, can, like can or lot coverage, can or give us a little more coverage and give us more height. What, what are you yeah, like more willing to do than this? My intent was for a breadth of housing options, or which would be the 50% units, or a depth of 80% units, like beyond the 10% that they're, if it were designed appropriately, that there could be some flexibility with things like setbacks and lot coverage and height. And, it, and, I, and it probably, it really depends on the site because, right. because uh, no matter what, um, there's always, in Reading, there's always some uh, butter issues that really need to be met, you know, and addressed. And so I'm not, uh, uh, no matter what, those are, those probably won't come off the table um, in terms of like making sure that that any development is sort of in, getting too far. Um, right. Um, but if I'm designing the building and I say, okay, I, I need, instead of 45 feet height, I need 47 feet height. So let me give you instead of a 10%, uh, I'll give you 15% uh, for that portability. Would you give me more height? Depends on the site. <coughs> yeah. It really does. But so it will be, I, I want to decrease the list iterations of coming to the CBDC meeting. Instead of having a three or four meeting, I can do just one or two meetings. If I know what, what flexibility I'm allowed to have, or what would I, uh, uh, expected to get that I'll design it accordingly, right? So is there any forum before I can come to the CPDC meeting, go to the end room and say, hey, I, 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 I'm yeah. willing to give you a 15% affordability, what do you think I should do? Increase the, my height or ask for the setback? I, I, I think right during um, what's the DRT, DRT yeah. they'll, they would have a good sense of which things are not going to fly, you know, and so on some parcels, height is probably, added height is probably not an, an option on some parcels, um, you know, smaller setbacks are probably not an option, but, you know, on others, height, yeah, adding another five, ten feet probably isn't that big of a deal. Um, so then they would have a good feel of that at that DRT, yeah. so you know. I think that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then with parking, I get it. The, South Main Street is the way it is, and it's about to be repaved to become an even faster autobahn. Um, but... <laughs> I feel like it's like from a planning perspective. I feel like the burden should be on them to prove why they need to pave more, not why they need to pave less. In terms of like setting a, a maximum on parking and having them tell us like why they need more than that is a better conversation to have than setting a minimum and then letting them just pave as much as they. I mean, the sites are tight, so parking is a challenge as it is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, uh, and I get where you're coming from, but let's look at the at a couple of sites that they're dealing with right now. Um, uh, uh, Perfectos. Yeah, Fusilli. And, yeah, Fusilli. Sam's Bistro, yeah. Fusilli's. Um, two classic examples where, um, you know, the even as we were approving them, we're like, this is... <laughs> pretty small in parking compared to your space and, and and the problem that what happened was all of that parking spilled o over onto the um, onto the residential streets mm -hmm. and that's right. exactly what we we don't want well, to happen and the performance the dog came so in. that's where they were parking 
for for big there wasn't yeah. enough yeah but my issue really is not that so I, I feel like developers are always providing parking for residential because they want to be able to sell the units yeah. or rent the units right it's commercial piece that we really need to make sure we get the parking for which is yes. what we're running that's the, the minimums that's what we that's what the meant minimum to be was put in here for residential um i think i already had it no maybe i had a maximum but that i don't have such an <clears throat> such an issue with it's like just from the conversations that we have like no one's coming and proposing a residential building with no parking it's the commercial piece that we need to account for the employees and the patrons and the non spill over on Main Street. And yeah. But we can waive any of this. I don't know. You don't think we can? No, I, I, I just don't know what the right answer is because the sites are really <coughs> tight already and having too high parking requirements can. Uh, I like the parking maximums where there's a really good alternative transportation, if you will. Right, we don't have it yet, but that doesn't mean that, right. that we won't ever. But in the meantime, I, well, I, I'll, I'll put it, if I were to, just, if, um, South Main Street is not a place where I think it's going to be a, a sort of a, a, um, a budding environment light, light for, rail yeah for, <laughs> for for some conversion to uh, to a to an area that's not necessarily um auto focused I mean, just simply because of the proximity to, to the highway yeah. and, yeah. there's so many wow. things yeah the lack of and the, it's just, yeah, yeah. But, that's it, but also the terrain i mean there's half of south main street is you know 12 feet up in the air and you can't do anything or it's or it's 14 feet below and the commercial district is so narrow that you can never create a there there. Yeah. It's really, you can't ever get a, a district. Because mm -hmm. it was built to be a, a car corridor. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to find that people will come in with less than that. They're going to want to put in less because they'll need more building. It's hard to make the access. site work. The sites work yeah. too. Yeah. Well, you can also ask for a parking plan that shares parking between the commercial and the residential. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. like and also between neighbors. Neighbors. And that's neighbors. like a real, that's really what we need. We need the neighbors sharing. Mm -hmm. Or canine man. They'll never officially share, but you can force them to have access into the next lot. Yes. yes. And also, I think that's if the should. town can negotiate and take the liability, which we have some we're working on. All right, that'll be good. That'll make Thank it you. more palatable. Is there any calculations for sharing? Like, uh, yes, I mean, need minimum one parking for 300 square foot of commercial, but in order actually you rent to the tenant, they generally want more parking. Commercial right, and usually you reserve spaces, so each unit will have one space reserved or two spaces reserved. Right. I would say you have um, institute some sort of where you get you get one space reserved, and maybe there's for the entire project there's 15, ten or fifteen spaces that are shared between residential and commercial, and I don't know, maybe they need stickers. If they're residential, they're only allowed to park there, you know, 5 p.m. <coughs> to 5 a.m. So you want us to propose that kind of a plan, so there's no like a calculation that's saying uh, one per 300 square foot commercial plus 1.25 per residence. So that's what we have, must have, you can share. But there's no calculation of exactly how much to share that. Yeah, it all, well, it depends on what your project is and how everything works. It, it but, really depends what your commercially, what the commercial use is, yeah. And, yeah. and you know how much yeah. you. Well, I mean, the um, classic issue is like it's really the issue. Bell's Barber Shop and Domino's. Zone, like, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Stretch of residential. It's like. I mean, you got, you got three tenants in one building. The stretch of. Uh, yeah. Just make it. 
I think the phrase is the board so would look build favorable more on any though. such toy. You're get. You'll just get mixed use, right? You'll get. So that's okay, because then it's more transitional. So, are there other items? I mean, I think we made good progress. Yeah. I, I don't feel like there's anything in here that is that we are hung up on. No. I think we're in agreement. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think I had that many comments on the other one. Yeah. Um, the only issue that I have with this um, intensity regulations one is the transitional areas. I feel like it's super unclear mm -hmm. and maybe stupid. I can't remember our discussion on this table. Is so it, yeah, if you look at page five on the intensity regulations one, pages four and five, I have some questions about. What is going on with that? First thing that comes to mind is that it's given the existing properties and situations is almost obsolete. This is well, not that I'm not right. This is an existing table. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has existed for many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like. I'm, so when I'm reading it, I'm thinking it's supposed to be an additional required read. yard area. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Um, and then I'm like wondering what that really is going to achieve. But it's existing. Yes, but I just, it, it's, I, it, because it includes business A, which we're like looking at and changing regulations for, I feel like we might want to take it out. Because I think it's like either at odds with what we want or not contributing in a positive way. This is, you're saying business A and B, sharing a lot line with a transitional area? No, sharing a lot line with a residence district. Mm -hmm. An actual residence district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that Which is all of them at the rear. All of the rear, right, yeah. basically. So there's no additional, zero additional. At the rear. At the so rear. like, what good is that? And then side, then you're just buffering them more from each other, which doesn't make sense. And then front, like, when are you, when is that happening? Like, we don't need a front yard setback if the residential's in the rear. Like, we don't need an additional. But you wouldn't need a front yard setback if it were across the street. Well, right. I mean, Main Street's a pretty decent buffer, I would say. <laughs> I, yeah, I just think it's crazy language. Can we? I'm sorry, my brain has shut down. So. Yeah. Um, I feel like we're so close I don't necessarily want to schedule another meeting because I I'm, there's a couple of comments on these three. Why don't we just talk about them on July? And I think we can probably go through yeah. these on July. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> All right. Certainly so go. this is so this one with the transitional areas, like definitely sleep on it and r r like wake up tomorrow, remember why it exists, and <laughs> yes. tell me yeah. because right. just, we shouldn't just take it out if there's a real reason for it, which I'm sure there is or there was at some point. We we'll have to watch the video on our last discussion on this. I can't remember why we didn't touch it. So, and we updated the industrial piece of this last year, um, but so that could stay. Probably, it's probably okay. Um, and then business C we didn't really touch. 
I would just be more interested in looking at the business A piece of it, yeah. um, and then potentially business B while we're at it. If it's, <coughs> it seems not like enough. Well, just as a reminder, the uh, area between RMLD and the rain and the rain trucks is on the water. RMLD and the train tracks is industrial. industrial. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, we looked at that area last year. Right. I can't believe that was only a year ago. I had a child since <laughs> you, you had a whole other job. Back. <laughs> yeah. Oops. All right. So uh, I think yeah. um, I think we have um, we need to do two things. Um, oh, we need, we to, need to um, continue public hearings on yeah. um, mm -hmm. for the mixed use regulations and for the footnote so, one. Yep. Yep. Uh, to July 8th. Do we have to say a specific time? No. Um, no. Just say. As indicated in the future yeah. um, agenda. Can you still meet the November work deadline? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're still working towards that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor? Before you leave, we have a lot release, and that's off. All right, thank, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Queen. Um, okay, so the first one I'm going to send around is the 4K Tri-Party Agreement for Lyle Estates. Um, they are binding bond. Bonding the binder course and utility, final utilities for the project so we can release the lots for development. Just need to just sign. Yeah, you can sign the line. And then we have lot releases I need you to sign as well. Um, there are four lots. So I own these lots now? Mm -hmm. Not used to do. It's not being released from the covenant. It's a new job, yeah. For another 40 minutes, sir. <laughs> and I wanted to alert you to um, if some of you were thinking of coming to the select board meeting in July to talk about zoning by amendments. The meeting is now on July 9th. No pressure, because the staff will be there. What day is that, Tuesday? Tuesday, yeah. Tuesday, Tuesday. I don't know if like, they want to hear from staff or if they want to hear from you. Let's read on that. It was the, a joint meeting was really the goal of mm -hmm. CPDC members. And Nope. No. Uh, let's not go. Let's not, let's not call it that. Right. <laughs> say that maybe some CPDC members will be in attendance, right? Unless. Don't you have to call? Uh, don't you have to post it? We would. Yeah. I mean, we'll talk tomorrow. Would you? Yeah. Find out. Is it members to or, or uh, just if, like? If Tony and I and John are there, for example, does mm -hmm. that count as quorum? I think so. I believe yes. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any time the three of us together is a quorum. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know how the associate member thing worked. July 9th instead of 16th. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Tonight's meeting. All those in favor? Discussion? Nay. So moved. Wait, there it's back.